give me her check. I wasn't in that day. All right. Good morning, everyone. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Hiro Aragaki. I'm the new director of the Center for Negotiation and Dispute Resolution here at UC Law San Francisco. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you here. Thank you so much for making the effort to come and join us uh, for this special event that we have organized to coincide both with the uh, Law School's Alumni Week and the center's 20th anniversary, if you can believe it. Um, as many of you know, the center was started in 2003 by then Professor Melissa Nelkin. And since that time, it has consistently been recognized as one of the top 10 law school ADR centers in the country uh, by US News and World Report. Uh, among the various uh, activities that we are engaged in, uh, the center delivers 17 different ADR courses and clinics, offers an ADR concentration for JD students and a dispute resolution specialization for LLM students, uh, hosts an ADR team uh, that has received top accolades at student competitions around the world, uh, and organizes conferences, uh, speaker series, uh, trains judges and lawyers uh, and puts on other kinds of programming that uh, affect the ADR community. Um, so as you can see, a lot of things have changed since many of you were walking the halls here at UC Law San Francisco. Uh, I should also mention that the center has not once but twice been awarded the Ninth Circuit's ADR Education Award. Um, so I assumed the directorship of the center less than a year ago. Uh, so ironically, I can't claim credit for any of the things that I just mentioned. Uh, I really stand on the shoulders uh, of the uh, past directors of the center who have come before me, uh, the many adjuncts uh, and other members of our community who help make the center really what it is. So I just wanna make a quick shout out uh, to some people in the audience who are part of the center writ large. Uh, Sheila Purcell, uh, who was the longest serving director of the center and my immediate uh, predecessor. Is the mic still working? Yeah. Um, and who was responsible really for many of the distinctions that I just mentioned. Sheila, you have set a very high bar which has caused many sleepless nights uh, for me. <laughs> uh, there's also Clint Wasted. Clint was uh, a student at UC Law even before the center was started and was a, one of the first uh, members of our ADR moot court uh, team here. Uh, and since then, he has coached our team to numerous phenomenal victories uh, in many, many uh, mediation competitions throughout the world and really helped elevate the stature uh, of our ADR our moot court program. So thank you for that, uh, Clint. We also have a number of alums uh, and adjuncts who I think will be joining us soon. Uh, uh, one who is already in the room is Ruth Glick. Uh, we'll also be joined hopefully by Howard Herman, who many of you know. Uh, Claudia Bernard hopefully will be joining us at some point. Uh, and Teresa Carey, perhaps. Um, these are all prominent practitioners in the Bay Area, as you all know, and also leaders in our community. Uh, and they've really uh, helped enrich the classroom with all their wonderful experience. Uh, many of them have also helped us over the year, years with external facing uh, programming uh, and have helped uh, grow our reputation nationally and internationally. Uh, like the rest of you here today, there are just a few of the many distinguished ADR practitioners that we can claim as our alumni and that we're proud to be able to have in our midst. Um, you help enrich our community and you help uh, our brand internationally. Um, I also wanna give a shout out to my administrative team. So over here is Maddie Robertson, who is also an alum of UC Law San Francisco, uh, and since 19, uh, 2019, uh, the deputy director of the Center for Negotiation and Dispute Resolution. She's a mediator in her own right and has done uh, numerous conflict resolution trainings. Uh, before coming back to UC Law, she spent a decade working in community mediation nonprofits. Could we get Karen to come in for just a second? So we also have Karen Grayson, uh, who is our senior academic program coordinator. Uh, Karen. 
Karen basically runs the show. I'm just a puppet. Uh, she is the one who makes sure that uh, all the stuff gets done behind the scenes to make sure that programs like ours today uh, run flawlessly and seamlessly. And coming into the room is Teresa Carey. I have just given a shout out uh, to you as one of the core members of our adjunct faculty. Uh, thank you so much, Teresa, for everything you do. <laughs> uh, Great. So before I go over our program today, uh, let me first turn it over to my colleague, Clark Freshman, who is the senior uh, ADR professor among the permanent faculty here. Uh, just to say a few words of welcome. Uh, Clark's professional accomplishments and uh, distinctions are too numerous for me to mention in a brief introduction like this. But let me just say that his scholarship in teaching focuses on dispute resolution, including law and psychology, the effect of emotion on dispute resolution, resolution, lie detection, uh, and emotional skills. In collaboration with UCSF psychologist Paul Ekman, who pioneered the science of facial micro-expression recognition, uh, Clark trains lawyers and negotiators in lie detection and emotional skills worldwide. He's also a mediator, a negotiation coach, and an expert witness on arbitration. Uh, and he's also here with his wonderful dog, Jampa. Clark? Um, so, oh, who's my wonderful dog who just loves to play with people. So his name literally means loving kindness. So unlike my last dog, Tara, his cousin, who was all about food, he's all about playing with people. So we'll try to keep him restrained. Uh, so I want to start off, I'm going to say two kinds of things. So one, uh, what is special about the center and what has really made uh, made it great and will make it great in the future. Uh, and, and the other to start off with is just to uh, really welcome Hero. Uh, I was the negotiation faculty member on the search committee. I've been here since 2004 and every other search has been a hard search. And there have always been lots of strong candidates, lots of people that we interviewed, lots of people that we brought back for interviews and sometimes very um, different opinions on who to go forward with. And that's been true since I've been here with the exception of Hero, who was the unanimous choice of the appointments committee, the selection committee, and was unanimously uh, chosen by the faculty. So I really wanna welcome him here. And you might ask yourself, like, what is it that's so special about Hero? By the way, the fact that he gave a nice introduction to me, I'm gonna, I was gonna say nice things anyway about Hero, so don't, <laughs> don't feel it's merely the reciprocity effect. So Hero is an actual mediator and arbitrator, previously for AAA, now for JAMS. Uh, he develops internationally programs, uh, is affiliated with schools in England, is developing a new program in Africa, which I hope to work with on training people there, which builds to some extent on the work that was done uh, by Sheila and by Melissa Nelkin, and also by uh, Howard and Claudia, our very distinguished adjuncts there. So very distinguished in that way, and also has published extensively on arbitration in some of the uh, leading law reviews in the United States. So really wonderful that way. And also uh, brings, I think, and this is uh, part of the growth of CNDR, um, a diversity of perspectives, right? So, so most of you in the room have learned about interest-based negotiation, which is largely what's taught and facilitative mediation, which has a wonderful and incredible promise that doesn't exist anywhere outside of law schools. So um, what Hero brings and what he's, uh, what he organized in one of the symposia early on was to try to think about how to rebalance and reconnect with what mediation is actually like outside uh, mediation competitions and what's out, like outside negotiation competitions. And uh, I really enjoyed that symposium and the various people that uh, were here both live and on the magic of Zoom on the screen behind us. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and I really look forward to working with Hero and with Karen and with Maddie and, uh, and, and many of you who are in the room who I will say one of the great things about CNDR is having so many different adjuncts and having so many different small sections. When I taught at University of Miami, uh, I had a class of 60 students. We have someone visiting from George Washington, uh, Chuck Carver, who teaches a class of 60 students. And the ability, because of so many of the wonderful adjuncts in the room, as well as I think I also teach a couple of the sections as does here, uh, to offer these really intensive negotiation classes is wonderful. And for me at least, it's a two-way street. 
So in my class on lie detection for the readings for this year, I included three different reaction papers from students in the past. One, a student who had a severe uh, hearing disability and went on to win the national trial competition. Uh, one from someone talking about Star Wars and negotiation and reading facial expressions in Jabba the Hutt. If you want that paper for use in your classes, just email me. Uh, and by a third student who talked about another type of diversity. Oh, Jabba, do you just want to say hi to Hero? Go say hi to Hero. It's okay. Now you're going to sit down. So anyway, thank you all very much for contributing to this learning environment. And I really um, look forward to learning from all of you. And if there's anything that I or Jampa can share, which he's now sharing with Hero, um, I look forward to that as well. So thanks very much. And thanks especially to Karen and Maddie for organizing that. Thank you, uh, Clark. That was very generous. Totally unplanned, I have to say. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you for that. So let me also turn it over now to Sheila Purcell, who is the Emerita Clinical Professor at UC Law and the immediate past director of the center. Uh, for 16 years, Sheila designed and directed a public-private dispute resolution partnership of the San Mateo Superior Court, bar, and community that included civil, small claims, family, probate, complex litigation, and other court ADR programs and staff. She's consulted and presented nationally and in Bosnia, China, Hong Kong, Italy, India, and a range of other um, places. Sheila, would you like to say just a couple of words? Yes, thank you for having me today. And hope the whole center over the years. It's great to see old friends at noon. And a uh, big thanks to Karen and All right, so we have two panels this morning. The first panel is entitled, Everything You Wanted to Know About Starting a Mediation Slash Arbitration Practice or Taking It to the Next Level. So that panel will go from now until, I believe it's 10.30. Uh, we'll then have a short 15 minute break. So I hope you all brought your business cards and uh, uh, are ready to meet new faces. I know that some of the students here uh, will be very happy to meet you as well. Uh, our second panel is entitled 20 Years of ADR at UC Law San Francisco, uh, what we've accomplished, where we're headed, and how you can get involved. So in addition to Clint Wasted and Howard Herman, who is going to be joining us shortly, we will feature two students, uh, Ari uh, Khan, who is sitting over there in the green sweatshirt, and another student who will be joining us shortly. They've taken the majority of our ADR offerings, clinical uh, coursework, as well as the team, and so can really give you an inside peek into everything ADR in the law school. Uh, at 12, we will break for a buffet-style lunch, and I really hope that everyone can stay for that lunch because I'm going to be sharing uh, my vision for the future of the center, and I'd love to get your reactions and uh, your feedback. Uh, this is also a time, of course, for you to meet new faces and also reconnect with people who uh, you may not have had a chance to uh, speak with for a while. Um, for those who are interested in getting a tour of our new buildings, uh, there will be a tour at 2 p.m. after the lunch. Uh, Maddie, do you know where the tour departs from? Okay, did anyone sign up for the tour, by the way? <clears throat> okay, so uh, we will maybe arrange to get that information uh, for where the tour departs from. Uh, and if those of you who haven't signed up yet would like to take the tour, do let us know and we can put you on the list. All right, so I think it's time for me to start our first panel. And we are almost exactly on time. So that's perfect. <laughs> All right. So let me start with introductions. Uh, I'm going to start in alphabetical order just to be completely uh, equal. Uh, so let me start with Deborah Bogards. So Deborah is the past president of the UC Board of Trustees and an accomplished private mediator. She has practiced both as a plaintiff and defense attorney for the past 40 years in San Francisco, uh, mainly in the areas of personal injury, wrongful death, employment, elder abuse, and landlord-tenant law. Uh, she has almost 40 successful jury trials under her belt. For the past six years, she's been actively settling cases in both private mediation and as an MSC officer in Marin and San Francisco. She attributes her skill as a mediator to her ability to relate to both sides and employ tools to break impasse. 
To her left, uh, to her right, sorry, is Bruce Edwards. Um, Bruce has been an industry pioneer in developing the field of ADR. As a founding partner of Jams and Dispute and later Jams, he's worked at the epicenter of business and commercial mediation for the past three decades. Since 1986, he has mediated over 8,000 disputes throughout the United States involving complex multi-party lawsuits and specializing in matters of high emotion. Mr. Edwards teaches advanced mediation skills to mediators, attorneys, and judges throughout the country and around the world. <clears throat> uh, next to uh, the extreme left uh, from my vantage point is Rachel Ehrlich. So Rachel has been a full-time mediator for nine years with a strong background and specialization in the insurance industry. She has a nationwide practice that includes matters involving insurance coverage and bad faith, personal injury, uh, real estate, and professional liability, among others. She also speaks, presents, and writes on mediation, uh, insurance, and ethics issues, and serves or has served on various boards and committees relating to mediation. And she's just an all-around superstar, so I'm so happy, uh, Rachel, that you were able to join us. Last and certainly not least is Ruth Glick. Ruth is a full-time independent international and domestic arbitrator with a background as a lawyer, educator, and a businesswoman. With over 25 years experience, she has resolved a wide variety of complex business contract and tort uh, cases, uh, including financial distributorship and technology and trade secrets uh, matters. A Northern California super lawyer and best lawyer, Ruth is a past chair of the dispute resolution section of the ABA and currently serves on the Council of the American Arbitration Association, ICDR. All right, uh, so we have a phenomenal panel. Let me start with... Um, <clears throat> A couple of questions. So <laughs> maybe what we can do is uh, go down the aisle, so to speak, and maybe start with Ruth. Uh, so the question I'm going to ask each of you to maybe begin with is to describe a little bit your career path, right? How did you get to where you are now? What challenges did you face? Uh, how did you overcome those challenges? So that's number one. And number two, would be, um, what advice do you have for people who are either trying to make a transition uh, into a career as a neutral or already have a practice but want to be able to take that to the next level somehow? So Ruth, can we start with you? Okay, well, you're starting with the person who's had the most unusual path um, and probably a testimony that anyone can do it uh, because I, my path was not traditional. Law is my third career. Um, I was a uh, I was a trader on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and I was a host of a daily live television program in Chicago with the ticker tape underneath. <laughs> but as a trader in the foreign currencies and the international money monetary market, there were always disputes because we had to mark to market at the end of the day, and disputes got um, resolved informally on the floor of traders and one trader would act sort of either as a mediator or as an arbitrator and make a decision. We weren't lawyers. We were, you know, it, this is the roots of dispute resolution in the commercial space to resolve issues, to go and move forward. So, um, but when I moved to California, I of course attended Hastings. Uh, now you see, nope, you can't hear me. Okay. At that time, we called Hastings Law School, and um, uh, I think at that time, I, uh, a few years later, I, in, from 1995 to 2005, I was an adjunct and I taught arbitration law here. It was before Clark came on board, and I formally taught arbitration law, and I put together my whole book and and uh, remember having so many different guests right around the corner. We'd have Supreme Court justices from the state come and I'd have um, attorneys come and do mock arbitrations and have the class uh, uh, learn to write an award. Uh, from that, I tried to build uh, my arbitration and mediation practice, which through the years I have. Um, and if you want me to also answer the question of what I recommend for people, um, I would say, and you need to know what you want to do. I always knew that I, that part of the law, 
attracted me to resolve disputes. But I would say choose an area um, of law where you can practice uh, dispute resolution. As I said, I came kind of from the financial area. And so naturally I went and at that time, FINRA was called NASD. And I sat as an arbitrator for many years uh, and which people can do, you don't, uh, you can be a public investor. You don't even have to be a lawyer. You can sit as an arbitrator and you really learn a lot uh, doing that. So number one, uh, choose some part of ADR that uses, uh, some part of law that uses ADR. And that's now in the employment area, international law, construction law, and I'm sure, um, and labor law as well. And secondly, I would say get involved in professional organizations uh, that are connected with ADR, the ABA, the dispute resolution section where I was chair, um, the California Law Association now has a dispute resolution committee and programs, uh, just a number of different organizations. I met Rachel at the Mediation Society here in uh, San Francisco. And get involved if, if there are any students here, they love to have students and, and um, it's a way for you to meet uh, people in the profession. And thirdly, I'd say get some clinical experience yourself. And how do you do that? As I said, FINRA may, uh, allow, may, may allow you to represent people. I don't know, it might be the unauthorized practice of law, but uh, there must be other opportunities within um, the legal system. Uh, I think in construction law, you could do it. In labor law, you could do it. And try to get some actual feet on, foot on the ground experience. So with that, I think I'll pass, pass the gavel to you. <laughs> Should I con continue? Great. Yes, please do. I don't do. want to interrupt the yep. flow here. Uh, thank you, Hero, for uh, the kind introduction, uh, Clark, Sheila, everybody who's been instrumental in developing the center. It's great to be back at Hastings. Um, it's, I haven't been in this building for over 40 years. I think when I was last here, I was sitting shoulder to shoulder in criminal procedure with Deborah. And uh, <laughs> pleased to report that being back here has not triggered my PTSD. So I'll just keep going. I'll just keep going. Um, Hero used the word pioneer, and um, I, I need to help everybody get in a time machine and go back to the 1980s for a moment to sort of understand my career path. Um, because as a Hastings student at the time, there, uh, there was a course on negotiation. The ADR course was exclusively about arbitration. Nobody knew anything about mediation. It was never discussed. Um, to understand uh, how um, synonymous litigation was with law school and everyone's legal career, you have to sort of keep certain things in mind. I mean, it was, uh, we would, Deborah and I would go interview for jobs. And the first question you would ask an employer was, how quickly am I going to get in the courtroom? And uh, you'd take a job uh, with a litigation firm and the culture was all about winning through litigation and you were trained to be a litigator. You go down to the courthouse where I parked this morning and look across the street and uh, on a Monday morning, there'd be a hundred lawyers in the law and motion department arguing various pretrial motions, smiles around the room. Those of you that remember Ira Brown kind of running his uh, kingdom over there and people would run in and out of uh, the courthouse all day coming and going to trials. And I remember one day, Melvin Belli driving up in his Rolls Royce and being dropped off at the base of the stairs and everybody looking at this, you know, icon of the legal community. And you go back to your law firm at the end of the day and the cocktail bar would open up and everybody come back from their trials and tribulations that day and share war stories. And so in those early days of being a young partner in a litigation firm, you know, I would call myself probably more a heretic than I would a pioneer, because what I did in those days was kind of look around and say, wait a minute, I don't think the emperor's got any clothes on here. Uh, there's, there's a different way of doing things and one that's more in tune with my background in psychology. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a divorced family. I uh, paid my way through college being a resident advisor for a number of years. I worked in a men's resource center. And I think kind of the universe chose me. You know, ego is a dangerous thing. And I wish I could say I woke up one day with this great epiphany and I had a business plan all mapped out. But it just sort of flowed. And then one day uh, I was exposed to a semi-mediation process and the light bulb went on. And I said, there is a better way. And I think I know what it looks like. 
involved. And so after practicing law for about nine years, I left uh, one night walking out of the law firm uh, with an idea. I had no gravitas. I was not a retired judge. I was not a named partner in a law firm, had no venture capital backing. I just had a good idea that I believed in. And we walked into a thousand square foot office. My sister came in at night and typed up letters and we started knocking on doors. And the challenges in those early days were legion because against that backdrop, nine out of 10 times, people closed their law firm doors in our face and said, you know, that's a nice idea, Bruce, but good luck. That's not for us. And uh, we continued knocking on doors until we realized strategically we were knocking on the wrong doors. And we started going to plaintiff's firms that specialized in personal injury because they had contingency fee arrangements with their clients. And they would say, wait a minute, we can settle this case in the first year without waiting five years for a trial? Let's talk, come on in. Or we talked to insurance companies and people we'd grown up working with who said, I've got 200 files on my desk, Bruce. I'll give you the worst five that keep me awake at night and see what you can do with them. And we started sort of picking the low hanging fruit and really building the bridge toward an ADR community one plank at a time. And from those humble beginnings, we grew into end dispute. Uh, we grew into uh, a merger with Jams. We were the first attorney-based mediation company um, in the area uh, on the West Coast. And then we merged with End Dispute. We merged with Jams and brought all the lawyer mediators. Pleasure of working with judges like Patrick when we ultimately merged with Jams. <laughs> um, and now, obviously, we're the largest mediation company in the United States and arbitration to a degree. Um, and so the early days, those challenges were different than many that will face you. But there was not a saturated market. There was just an uneducated market. We had to spend a lot of time trying to educate um, people about what mediation was in the first instance why they needed it is kind of the second tranche. And ultimately, by the way, we can deliver the service. So think about bringing us on board when uh, the next problem arises. So it was kind of a multi-tier marketing challenge in those days. And I think what helped us most was being very thoughtful and strategic about how we were going to approach the market. As Ruth was saying, looking for subject matter areas of expertise, um, <clears throat> You know, I, it's hard to say what advice I might give people who are looking to get into the business or advance your career. It's certainly one of the more common questions that get asked. It's why I wrote a 30 hour virtual course on our Edwards Mediation Academy platform. So I'm always hesitant about trying to summarize in five minutes, you know, those important lessons. But I do think it all starts with planning. I think it all starts with um, being strategic, as I said, uh, and being realistic. Um, I'll say this, you've heard it before, you know, good intentions are not a plan. My father used to say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, hope is not a plan. Uh, a strategic business plan is a plan. One like Ruth says that identifies specific areas of interest and um, realistic and accountable goals, both short term and long term. I still remember writing the first business plan, you know, 30 plus years ago thinking, you know, all I need to do realistically is convince two or three people a month to try our services. If I can do that, we can keep the lights on, we can, we can pay the rent and move forward. And uh, ultimately uh, that proved to be more than successful and achievable. In terms of personal things people can be thinking about, uh, I'm sure Clark will attest to this, but Mo, one of the things that's uh, my favorite topic, I'll be here next week talking to Heroes class, is the importance of, of self-reflection, self-development, um, and uh, developing emotional competency as one of the many skills, personal skills. Ultimately, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, one of those things <clears throat> that will serve you best is what you do behind closed doors, delivering quality mediation services. And that, as much as anything, is going to advance your career. So think about <laughs> developing your own uh, individual skills first, then uh, consistent with a business plan, think about what your niche is going to be, particularly in this more competitive environment of this day and age. And from there, perseverance. And just know that, uh, uh, as the famous author said, long after the final no, there lies a yes. And on that, <laughs> yes, the world depends. <clears throat> and just stay focused and stay persevering. Because at the end of the day, the process is um, 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 uh, not just workable, but eminently needed. And we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, some other thoughts I have on that. But uh, thank you for listening. That's very inspiring, Bruce. Let, let me ask you a follow-up question, if I may. So did you 
kind of just stop your law practice and then start a fresh mediation practice right after that? Or was there a period when you were kind of doing both, trying to develop a mediation practice while you were still you know, holding down a full-time job, so to speak? Yeah, thanks for asking. It's, um, uh, I was one of those rare people that kind of like a trapeze artist, you're flying through the air and you have to let go of kind of one bar and you're kind of hanging in the air for a while untethered before you grab onto the next ring. And that's what I did because I felt in those days that um, it was worthy of devoting 100% of time and attention. I um, was kind of hanging on by my fingernails because I didn't have, you know, Warburg Pincus backing me with venture capital like some other companies did, you know, going forward. Um, and it was all about uh, trying to get from one month to the next uh, through our budget and uh, making sure we could we could make it happen. But it's uh, um, I don't think generally to those of you who are starting out, I realize the economics, don't get me wrong, people have to cover the bases. But I also think that when people are looking to entrust their most valued client to your services, they're not looking to for a part time mediator, by and large. Look, I don't get on the plane like I did last month flying to the other side of the world and hope to hear the pilot say, good morning. This is my first day of flying the 767. And part of the rest of my time I spend uh, doing other things, but I'm glad to be here with you today. And let's see if we can get this bird off the ground. I just think uh, full time commitment is important. Great, thanks. Deborah. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Hero, for having me. It's wonderful that our law school, whether it be UC Hastings or now UC Law, by name change, um, has such a prestigious clinic. Um, Bruce and I graduated from here in 1981. When I started law school, I was 23 years, no, I'm sorry, I was 20 years old. I didn't know what a plaintiff or defendant was. I didn't have a background. I came from a poor family. I was the first one to go to a graduate school. And here I was in law school. Um, I'm the opposite of Bruce. I didn't have a plan. I didn't know what I was going to do. I have more of the osmosis theory of life where I fall into things and decide I like it. So I'm a big proponent of sampling things through law school. Um, I have Atan here today who's hoping to go to law school. I said, come see what we do. Um, and there's many judges in here that are on my board of trustees that I want to welcome as well. So when I graduated in 1981, uh, I actually just stayed up here and started practicing. I fell into doing insurance defense. Uh, and with that, I did 38 years of insurance defense, which meant I managed two law firms. I also didn't know anything about management. And I tried uh, 37 cases. I think 36 were jury trials and one was a bench trial. Successful in almost all of them. You need to have a few failures to really appreciate the successes. And what that did for me was it helped me build my reputation as a very formidable defense attorney who uh, interfaced with attorneys, judges, and mediators, hopefully with professionalism and integrity. And I learned the effective way to communicate with claims adjusters, claims managers, and the hierarchy of insurance companies. I dealt with coverage issues, liens, and workers' comp. Uh, then for an overlapping 20 years, and now for the last five, six years solely, I've been on the plaintiff side, and I've been doing primarily personal injury and uh, employment, some elder abuse, some landlord tenant. So I am now a part-time mediator. Next year, I will be full-time. And that's by choice. Uh, I had gone into the plaintiff side and I'm doing very well. So it helps to have that as I'm building my mediation practice. Uh, I believe that my background has given me subject matter expertise. I work with experts. I know how to do a trial budget. I know deadlines. I understand motions and limine. And those are very important when you are talking to the plaintiffs or the defendants as to what this will look like if they don't settle today. And oftentimes you can't count on their attorney to give them the tools they need to make mediation successful. I am very surprised when I find that out, but I can sit down and work numbers with them. Uh, this is the amount of money you're going to take home today. I mean, sometimes you get down the nitty gritty, don't you? And this is, you know, after attorney's fees and costs, but this is what it will look like at trial. By the way, did you know about expert costs and videographer and depositions are $2,300 a pop? And so if I sit down sometimes and work out numbers, it really helps them. Or 
I have an understanding still of the experts in the marketplace. So I know uh, battle of the experts will come. It helps to, I believe, use my subject matter expertise and background as a trial attorney. And uh, I believe that 99% of cases today settle through mediation. Back when Bruce and I first started practicing, you would pick up a phone and you would do this game of negotiating informally. And as a defense attorney, I probably had full settlement authority, but you'd play the game of, well, let me call the carrier. You'd call back and you'd do it back and forth. I heard of public defenders and DAs used to have like red wine licorice that they would exchange to do their negotiations. And then at some point, and I don't know if it was maybe 20 years ago, it changed. There was a shift where we all went to mediation. And the beauty of mediation is you've got a four hour, eight hour or a few days set aside where your case has every adjuster and um, decision makers attention. And that's got a value. So um, my career path has taken me here. Uh, I love it. I love helping people. What I tell people is, hey, I'm just a Jewish mama and now Bubala. So <laughs> I love to help people with disputes. It's like kids on the playground. Um, and I use that. So my advice to those of you who are interested perhaps in a career this way is maybe you take a course or two. There are various out there. Bruce has talked about one that he's created. There are local people who give courses in schools and so forth. Try it out. Um, Sanford Kingsley and I were in an MSC course at San Francisco Superior Court not too long ago. Um, and so I help with Marin County where I live and San Francisco Spirit Court doing their MSCs, which are very instructive because two weeks before trial, you're helping people. They've worked on maybe this case for five years and you're helping them let go and get closure. So it feels really good. It also gives you practice if you haven't been doing it. Um, and then I'd say those of you who are practicing, pay attention to different mediator styles. Um, because I mean, I still mediate and I learn something when I'm with different people. And then the last thing is create your own style. It's like what I used to tell trial attorneys, use your authentic self. Um, I, for example, like to do very, uh, a lot of preparation before mediation. I will look through every document they give me, if they're deposition transcripts, their medical records, um, contracts, and I do my own chronologies and timelines, because I feel that if I have knowledge and I'm prepared before I go in, I can really help them talk it through. And so I'm big on pre-mediation telephone conferences. So see what works for you and um, develop that style. Lasting creativity is so important. So every part of your background, every part of each mediator arbitrator's background here, they use to their advantage. So just think of what your strengths are, um, the relatability to the plaintiff, the ability to think creatively and strategically as to how to bring the parties together. All of us have that ability to have them say and get to yes. Thank you, Deborah. Rachel? All right. So, hi, Rachel Ehrlich. It's great to be here. Um, so I'm actually probably the tail end of the experience pre-center being created. Um, I took in my last year of law school a mediation class from somebody who worked with Bruce back in the day, pre-jams and so on. Vivian Williamson um, was an independent mediator at that point, and she taught a mediation class. And the reason I took it, it was because I had been working as a law clerk with an insurance company and in their staff counsel office. And I went to mediations with the lawyers and I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to be doing this work and I, I'm going to be a customer. So maybe I should see it from the other side and learn a little bit about it. I'll be a better consumer. So I took the class. I really liked it. And then back then you could still also take negotiation and mediation. So the second semester I did that with um, a, a name that some of you will know, and that's Maud Prevere, who went on from there to head up the Stanford program when Manukian went to Harvard. So um, that was a great class as well. And again, I came to it with the knowledge that I was going to be a consumer of mediation. And I also am a little bit strange. I went to law school to be an insurance coverage lawyer. So you can just put a giant nerd neon sign over my head because that is about the nerdiest job around. Um, maybe other than like wanting to be an appellate clerk or something. Um, so the, uh, but aside from that, it's a pretty nerdy job. And I didn't want to be a litigator. 
The idea of being up in court scared me. And the first thing I did was I got a job with an insurance defense firm that was known for doing heavy duty, big insurance, bad faith litigation. And the day I was sworn in, I had to go to court. So, you know, it was like, okay, I guess I'm going to get better at this public speaking thing and learn a little bit more about this. But it was a great experience. And then the insurance company called me back and said, would you like to come back? You'll have to do just regular personal injury, subrogation, construction defect work, and you're just going to have a litigation docket. I'm like, okay, fine. So I walked in. Fortunately, I'd already taken a deposition. I wasn't even a year into practicing. And the person said to me, really nice to have you back. I'm sorry to tell you this. You have two depositions tomorrow. <laughs> oh, the plaintiff and your client. Has anybody talked to my client about how to prepare, you know, like what to expect? No. Okay. I'm going to get on the phone. So it was dumped into active litigation files. I had to conduct, you know, I had to do the arbitrations myself because it was soup to nuts. It was the whole thing and develop rapport with clients and some of what Deborah was talking about. Um, I got lucky. They said, all right, we're going to create an in-house coverage program. So then after less than a year, it was now you have a multi-jurisdictional coverage practice. And oh, by the way, you're going to do regulatory compliance as well. So, you know, there's like market conduct exam surveys and other reports up in Washington that say, who is this California lawyer, Rachel Ehrlich, who's giving <laughs> advice on Washington compliance? But it gave me perspective. And I worked with people going up the food chain. I worked at Travelers Insurance, big company, you know, would go to home office and stuff like that. And like Deborah, to me, it was just the jungle gym of life, which is things happened, different opportunities presented themselves. One day I was driving into work and I thought, eh, I'm really not enjoying this anymore. I can quit my job. I totally quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in like 2005, I think. And that evening I'm driving home and my boss's boss calls me and offers me a management job with national responsibility. And I was like, well, I, I think I need to talk with my spouse. And by the way, do I have to move? Because I don't know if I want to live in Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> So, um, no, you can stay there. And that's been the hallmark of my career. I then ended up managing bad faith litigation. Bruce said to me today, have we met before? And I told him about a mediation we did in Las Vegas back uh, way back when, and uh, where it got settled pretty much on the plane coming back because we all had to race to the plane you know, to get to our, get to the Vegas airport and come home. But those were that all kind of prepared me to move on ultimately to managing an insurance claims department. And I had huge responsibilities across the country and internationally as well. Um, and I burned out just managing people. I felt like I had gotten away from things and I thought, okay, I'm going to quit my job. This time I'm really going <laughs> to quit my job. <laughs> and people said um, at that point, are you, what are you going to do? I don't know. Maybe I'll scoop ice cream. Who knows? Or be a dog walker, right? <laughs> um, and nobody believed it. Finally, people believed it. And four different people asked me if I would become a mediator. Hmm. And at that point, it's 2013. Okay, that, that nascency of the industry that Bruce talked about was gone. It's a saturated market, plenty of people. I'm not known by any plaintiff lawyers at all. My network is national. It's not local. And, but I still ask the people, these were four different people who didn't know each other. A couple of them were defense lawyers. A couple of them were, um, were coverage lawyers. And each one said, one person said, would you consider being a mediator? And I asked, well, why are you asking? What do you need? Kind of going to that identify that Ruth was talking about, identify your market. And um, that person said, well, I need people who can be good with individual plaintiffs, can explain complex coverage stuff, and also the inner workings of insurance decision-making to people who don't understand it and are personable. I don't know how personable I am, but it was like, okay, fine. Thank you for the feedback. And then somebody else said, you should be a mediator. You know, I want to try cases, but my clients need to, to settle them. So... Yeah, you'd be good at it and I would use you. Both of them did when I ultimately did it. 
but it took me six months to decide to do it and taking a job actually that was a bad fit deciding to rip the band-aid off and deal with my mother's memory issues and stuff and then um took a class because i figured it had been 20 years maybe i should be respectful of people and say you know i it did bother to go get trained again not just like hey here i am use me and i uh, shadowed some people some people were really generous um and then i uh, but i launched my practice on may 14 <clears throat> of 2014 so we're coming up on nine years exactly so in a month it will be nine years and in the first 90 days i had my first mediation i did my practice backwards compared to what you are supposed to do now to start a practice so kind of like you know i quit my job everybody says don't quit your day job and I also did no pro bono mediation for the first year, none. I started getting paid. And in the first year I took in over six figures. I also in the first year had no mediations that were local. I got on a plane for the first one in August of that year and it continued in that way. It was always on a plane. The first one that was not I didn't have to be on a plane was up in Santa Rosa. I still had to drive <laughs> more than an hour and a half to get there. Um, I didn't have an office space. I decided, you know, I wasn't going to take on that overhead. I did write a business plan and I really think it's important. And you have to have a niche now. Being a generalist doesn't work anymore. That I, th I think having a niche is really important. So I tell people, don't do it the way I did it because you know it's it's not the best way <laughs> although i think if you can if you can do so i mean i thought i needed to really focus i had offers from law firms would you open a san francisco office or do other things like that i actually had an offer from an insurance company to run a new department it's like no i don't want to do these things i want to focus on this and i because i wanted to do it full time and i knew it takes 3 to 5 years to build a practice so you get into it and you start working it. And it, it has been a tremendous journey and it's a tremendous honor to work with people. And I think the thing is when you are, because one of our tasks here today isn't just about how to get into it, but it's also about how to take it to the next level. And I think that the difference that has been made is that, um, you know, you start to get busy and you need to raise your rates. But there's uh, because you, you keep thinking, OK, if I raise my rates, some people will drop out. Some people do. But when you raise your rates, then you start getting more complex cases. And so you have to decide, I think, where you want to be in the marketplace, because I do think sometimes there's a bit of a thing of, oh, I'm paying you X dollars per hour, or X per day, and they're thinking about it. And there's a little bit of you reach a certain point where they're like, OK, show me that you're really worth it you know <laughs> you have this reputation prove prove that you can settle my case and um there's you have to develop ways to remind people mediators don't settle cases the parties do and you know you're here because there's a limited inventory that's why you're paying what you're paying but also change your niche that's another thing you can do as you're taking things to the next level. Focus more on certain areas, or if there's an area that interests you, learn about it and move on to those things. Because I think that that keeps it interesting and keeps you from burning out. Um, and I'm watching colleagues who sometimes sort of are starting to burn out, and we'll have conversation about that. What is what prevents the burnout? And being aware of that. So it goes to the self-reflection that, that Bruce was talking about, too. Uh, but I also think it's important to maintain those business plans too. You have to regroup and think about them. I do want to make a comment about something Clark said, which was the thing of interest-based negotiation and bargaining being only taught in law school and it's the only place that exists. He's right. Okay. And it is, um, I think it's shocking to people when we work with them. And in fact, we are bringing their interests out in the context of a commercial mediation where the caucus model is used extensively and sometimes exclusively. Um, and lawyers have to be persuaded to allow their clients to be more forward in mediation. 
and it depends on who the client is. And there's also, I mean, sophisticated clients will sometimes use their attorney to shield you from learning about things, but less sophisticated clients are very deferential to their lawyers and they will cede too much control to them. And so there's a, you probably know this from, you know, your plaintiff work versus working with claims people and how claims people will sort of game the mediator and things like that too. They'll be like, oh, well, you know, I'm the one with the checkbook, but look, you're talking to my lawyer, you know, good. And they'll do it on purpose sometimes. So it's a matter of knowing those things, but it's also what are those interests? Even, even insurance companies have interests, even when it's not a bad faith case. So being aware of that too. All right. Thank you, Rachel. See, I told you she was a superstar. <laughs> um, so what I'm hearing uh, in terms of themes are subject matter expertise is really important. Um, getting involved in professional organizations, getting some real experience. And I want to get back to that issue in just a minute. Uh, perseverance, having a business plan, um, being yourself, being uh, comfortable in your skin, being authentic to your values, it sounds like is another thing that I'm hearing. Um, maybe a little bit of luck, right? Uh, shadowing uh, folks and getting more experience that way. One of the things, Rachel, I thought was interesting about your story is that you know, you were not doing mediation for many, many years. You, you, you took the courses and so on, and you had some early exposure to it, and then you kind of took a break for it for uh, many years, but that gave you some really great in-house experience, which you then parlayed into this niche uh, that is a fantastic niche to have in mediation. Um, and so I thought that was also an interesting um, aspect of your career path. Um, any other thoughts from the other panelists about taking an existing practice to the next level? So Rachel talked to us about raising rates and also changing your niche. Um, other thoughts for those of us who are already kind of practicing, have a, a, a practice and maybe a full-time practice, but just want to do more of it or want to get different kinds of cases or better cases. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe Rachel talked about raising your rates, which I found really interesting because uh, this year I raised my rates and I was terrified, <laughs> absolutely terrified because there's nobody out there that's training me on how to be a mediator. And I raised my rates because someone said, why are you still practicing and doing mediation? I said, because I'm the sole breadwinner. I'm still working because I like to shop. And so, <laughs> so they said, why don't you just raise your rates? I'm like, oh God, I'm so nervous about that. And my colleague said something very instructive for me. He said, well, you might lose some people. They may drop off, but then you're going to gain a lot of people that you don't even know at this point. He's absolutely correct. So Everything you do strategically, again, I'm the osmosis theory of life. I just fall into things. I did raise my rates. A couple of my friends did drop off. Then they had some failed mediations. And I said, well, maybe it's worth paying me a little extra because you know I'm going to get it done. And I have gained a lot of people. What all of us, uh, I think, also want to talk about is, well, how do you get started? Do you market um, how do you let people know that you have this idea that you're going to be a great mediator? And um, I would love to hear everybody's thoughts on that here. For me, I did something that's maybe counterintuitive. I go to a lot of legal parties at the holidays, and I decided to go up to six people and hand them, and I did brochures, and I know we have different views of it. For me, it was a prop. It forced me to go to six people, hand them brochures, and said, hey, I'm doing mediations now. <laughs> I would love to work with you. And so just random people at well, these parties. Friends at, at these friends of friends. Okay. Got lawyers it. at these holiday. There was lawyer holiday parties. And so I wanted to let them know that I'm now a mediator. And so for me, it was just using my voice to start telling people. And that was how I did it. And then slowly going through the courts, doing the MSCs, volunteering through those process, you're gonna show your work and people are gonna go like, ah. Oh, I really like her or him. I think I want to use them again. And so I follow up with my materials. Um, I developed just like a brochure that I turned into one page because we're all online. I have a rate sheet. 
And then like Rachel, I tend to write a lot of articles. And so I give them a couple of the articles as well. Um, and so you just think of your style of how you're going to get it out there. And then pretty soon, really the reason you're hired is your reputation. People will say like, Rachel, oh my God, she was so great. She just killed it the other day mediation. And then that attorney is going to call and use her. So eventually that's why she said three to five year plan. I agree with that. It's just going to start flowing. Yeah. So self-promotion is also a key piece of this, right? You've got to be really good at pushing yourself and, and getting your name out there. Yes, Ruth. I just want to take it from the uh, arbitration yes, point of view excellent. where you don't quite self-promote because you are a neutral and you have to remain impartial and independent. But what you can do is build a reputation. Every case you preside over is a brick and you build that wall of, of, of a reputation of being fair and impartial because the plaintiff's bar, the defense bar, they all communicate with each other and they evaluate who the neutral is and how they've handled it. I think that you have to develop that uh, reputation for this impartial service, for professionalism, for expertise in certain areas, and for being a managerial arbitrator, because now arbitrations are like complex litigation. And you know it's, that's one of the, the downsides of it because it, it used to be more equitable and more informal, but now we have depositions, even interrogatories. I mean, we have, we're, I'm on one panel now where we uh, have third parties who we cannot subpoena. We have to go within 100 miles of where they reside to get their testimony. Everything's getting more complex, more like big time litigation. So um, you have to develop a reputation. You have to, um, can I talk a little bit about selection? Because, um, you know, you can't go out and hand out your card and say, select me as an arbitrator, because that sounds like you're going to be partial to that um, party. But um, you do. In fact, I, in fact, I was told by a very uh, well-known attorney uh, never to do that. And, and, and arbitrators have actually done that uh, to attorneys. And that's a, a huge no-no in the arbitration space. Yeah. But you can go out in different uh, professional uh, organizations, have conferences and meet people. I mean, they see you, then, you know, somehow people feel more comfortable if they've seen you. Um, you can present beyond panels. Now through Zoom, you can present all over the world. I mean, you know, can you, I can do things for the New York Bar Association, for example. I can hold arbitrations um, through Zoom, and it's not limited to just this area. Um, I think uh, you can write papers. Uh, you can... Um, write opinion pieces for the legal uh, newspapers or magazines. Again, that builds your reputation that you know something. You can teach courses. Um, uh, you can, um, uh, I think, again, um, uh, I think another thing in this internet world is you better have a really good LinkedIn page because everybody, that's the first thing they do is Google you. And the first thing they go to is LinkedIn also helps to have a good website. I have my own website. I have everything you want to know about me, everything I've written and where I presented and et cetera, et cetera. Because before they select you, they want to know everything there is to know about you. In addition to checking with other lawyers and how you've ruled or whatever. Um, I know that in some of the mass arbitrations that I'm now, um, we, we can no longer have um, class action arbitrations, but in the mass arbitrations where um, there are thousands of cases and uh, you're selected to do one or several. And sometimes now when we write, uh, there are a lot of motions and write some determinations in the beginning, which sort of sets the case on course. Uh, the lawyers send it out to every other arbitrator and every other uh, lawyer. So, so they begin to see how you've written a decision. So that's, no, that's, that's a way to so be careful with every decision that you write and uh, make sure that it's a reasoned, uh, well-reasoned and well-written award. So um, I think there are um, advantages to entry now because everyone's looking to diversify, have more women, have more, more minorities. Um, I know that when I started, I was usually the only woman in the room. And I just have to put in a plug for ABA that um, 
uh, when I was chair, right, I started Women in Dispute Resolution, which is now one of the largest uh, uh, committees of the dispute resolution section. And it's open to men as well. Um, <laughs> but what, um, it's a good resource because uh, they help you. They have uh, trainings on how to write resumes, uh, how to, uh, they have a uh, directory. So your name is published in a national directory that you're available. Uh, they have people come in and how to, uh, you know, gather business, how to uh, jumpstart uh, business. They have different uh, panels that people can serve on throughout the country. I mean, there are lots of, there are not, it's not only the American Arbitration Association and JAMS, there's uh, American Health Lawyers has, has a panel. They're all, you know, construction industries, dispute resolution boards, all kinds of different areas, depending on what uh, area of law you're in. So there are a lot of resources out there, but you have to, again, get involved within the profession uh, and you will meet people and you will uh, get ideas and you will pursue uh, the interests uh, uh, that will suit you the best. Thank you for that, Ruth. Let me just recap a couple of things that I heard. You also suggested, so presenting on uh, panels and at conferences, getting involved in things like the ABA dispute resolution section, um, for those of you who haven't joined that uh, group yet, writing and uh, teaching, maybe posting on LinkedIn. I think social media is really now the way that we all get our information. Uh, <clears throat> so that I think is also really great advice. Bruce, do you want to add anything? Couple to all thoughts. This? A lot of good ideas. I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, let's broaden the thinking just a little bit because uh, a lot of our collective focus and experience is in the world of commercial mediation and arbitration. But I, I don't have the privilege of teaching law students that often. But when I do, or I get a chance to talk to young mediators um, in the profession, I try and, and not just here, but in other countries, I try and remind people. Look, think more broadly. I think the majority of career paths in the dispute resolution world have yet to be invented. Think about that statement for a moment. We think about uh, what we do is sort of defining the industry, and for the moment it does. But in the last 30 years, we've really shaped the industry uh, and defined it. But that isn't the end of the trajectory. It's just the beginning. And so, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, mediation societies have evolved. We've started to see people come in from different uh, areas of the profession. Uh, we all know, you know, about community mediation, about family law mediation. Uh, we all know uh, uh, about online mediation uh, that's been developing in the last 10 years. Um, certainly, we uh, come into contact with mediators that work in prisons, uh, ombuds in both governmental uh, institutions as well as commercial uh, ventures, high tech, uh, hospitals, universities. Um, this is just a myriad of um, entry points in the profession that obviously uh, are not um, unique to having a legal background for that matter, as we tell people. But think broadly as you think about your career path, because um, really you need to start by focusing on your own skill set and then identify your passion. Well, you know, what's the dent in the universe you want to make and uh, how you go about it? And it may or may not involve commercial mediation per se, but that doesn't mean there isn't a world of disputes out there that are in desperate need of attention. There is. Um, when I do get to teach, usually it's people who are um, experienced mediators and looking to advance their profession. And for 25 years, I've taught that program at a different law school in a different part of the state. Um, <laughs> and um, so we always uh, we kind of try and figure out how do you get people from um, a certain level of, of expertise and success to a higher level. And as has already been mentioned by some of my colleagues, looking to expand your practice in unique uh, market areas. I mean, years ago, I had somebody in a class come up and say, Bruce, with this developing industry of uh, marijuana distribution centers, I'm going to be a specialist in mediating those cases. Right. You look at mega trends like we're going to be facing probably a glut of commercial office space in the next you know, five or 10 years. What kind of disputes is that going to create between lenders and, and tenants and landlords and others in that industry? Think about those kinds of things and position yourself to be able to address those issues going forward. And then, of course, as I always say, focus on your skill development. Recognize that mediation is a lifelong journey of learning. And so think about learning not just in discrete mediation type courses, but expand your education into 
related areas, uh, neurobiology, game theory, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a negotiation, there's a host of, of things that will serve you well as you develop both your sort of emotional competency and your negotiation skills uh, that will help further your career, you know, as you move forward. So pay attention to that level of detail. That's really great advice. And one of the things that this makes me think about is, you know, we teach about the distinction between positions and interests in our courses. And what I think you're saying is, think about your underlying interests. It may not actually be mediation. And the corollary of that for me is, it may be that it's mediation, but it's not necessarily to be a neutral mediator. There are lots of different ways to be involved in the mediation profession as a trainer, as a policymaker, as an academic. Um, and, uh, you know, think about that. One of the I think new frontiers really is tech and ADR, tech and mediation. A lot of people are getting into the ADR field, not as budding neutrals, but as legal entrepreneurs, uh, startup companies that are providing, you know, um, dispute resolution services for masses of cases, right? Both domestically and internationally online uh, and so on. So we are in Silicon Valley after all. So this might be also another area for people to start thinking about. So we have about 20 minutes left. I do want to make sure that people get a chance to ask questions. Uh, so are there any uh, questions from the floor you'd like to ask the panelists? Yes, please uh, say your name uh, and, and maybe uh, where you're from. Sure. Uh, I'm, Jim, I'm, I'm just curious, I know there's been a lot of, uh, I think probably exaggeration about the impact of artificial intelligence on our I, I uh, had the pleasure of spending a couple of days with Colin Rule when we were down teaching in Brazil in November. We had a couple of dinnertime conversations about the topic. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the concept of machine learning and advancing risk assessment quantitatively probably has an important role going forward. I don't think it's going to supplant our role as mediators. I think lawyers may have a little more to fear from that in terms of risk assessment when artificial intelligence can maybe uh, quantify um, the ch outcome chances. You know, and so the advice to uh, clients that lawyers are thought to uh, hold close and, and be paid dearly for maybe becomes a little less uh, authentic um, in that environment. But the skill set that we talk about as mediators, you know, I don't think it's in danger of being replaced by robot learning, you know, quickly, although who knows, you know, it's a fast developing, uh, you know, universe we live in. We were we were talking a little bit about this before we started, and uh, you know, could uh, Chat GBT take over the role of an arbitrator and massing all the information? But it's not. Uh, we, as we've learned, this this version is not <clears throat> as correct as it should be. But let's say 10, 20 years from now. But I don't know that you. I mean. I love machines and all the AI and everything that's going on, but can you replicate judgment? Can you replicate human judgment? And that, that was, I, I know when I taught the class here, that's the hardest thing to teach is judgment. You get judgment from experience. Now you could say, well, the computer will learn from all the, you know, all the information that's fed from it, fed to it, but we're still human. And so I don't know if it's going to replace it. One of the things where I, was, yeah, I was thinking that in uh, mediation, you could get some of those robots from Boston Dynamics and you could um, have them be physically there at the mediation and you could program them and you could be doing three me mediations at once and <laughs> for profit organizations like Jams could, you know, really automate. Taking notes. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's uh, years ago, even before I became a mediator, I had encountered people who were using um, kind of, big, you know, and back in the day, it was called big data. And then it became the predictive modeling that we could get out of that. And it was about having negotiation prediction in real time. So you're putting in your you know, negotiation partner on the other side, you're putting in the data that you're getting from them, just the numbers back then, not the words that went with it. And um, then there would be, you'd put in what your goal was and it would suggest what your counteroffer would be. 
And as a mediator, there are times in some of the bigger business disputes where I can tell people are using that. Hmm. Yeah. And um, I mean, you know, there's that before we got started, Jenna mentioned to somebody that, you know, I had one mediation that went 19 and a half straight hours overnight. And that was a case, though, that started at over a trillion dollars in the demand. And, you know, I was thrilled when we got down into the billions and it was like midnight, you know, and a colleague of mine was there on an employment case where they were going to settle maybe at around, I don't know, 200 grand, which was a big employment case. And I said, oh, I'm so thrilled we're down into the billions. And he goes, he, he goes, wait a second, did you just say billions with a B? I said, yeah, we've been working on spreadsheets, on deal points and all this stuff, right? Super complicated deals require the leveraging technology. It's a question of, can you predict how a personal injury plaintiff who's got a soft tissue injury and, you know, they've got five grand in meds, how they're going to feel about their case? Because that, I don't know if we're going to be able to get there. You might be able to do it based on probabilities, but I don't know if we'll get there completely. I think that there's... We have to get to the point where the AI can actually get the input on what's being said and merge that with the numbers because they all speak. I'll be curious. I think it'll probably get there part of the way. We're probably still going to need to have some element of human judgment be the overlay. So if I can, so I deal with, I just call it nuts and bolts. I deal with catastrophic injury, wrongful death, sexual molest. These are areas that take great emotional um, uh, bandwidth for both the mediator and for the parties and attorneys involved. And so there's so many things that I'm not as familiar with AI to know, but I'm looking in the Zoom room to see their paintings, their books, some little touch point that I can connect with and talk to them about. I'm looking at variables that have nothing to do with the monetary settlement. How is that person, the plaintiff, going to have a sense of letting go of having their day in court, if you will, but even a more emotional way? So I need to figure out and kind of talk to them a little bit to figure out what's it really, what's really at stake here and it's going to take. And it's not always the amount of money. And so then in the defense room, you know, I don't know, maybe AI would have more success there if it is just number driven. But I also find the attorneys are the ones that get in the way. Attorneys have egos, sometimes oversized egos that you have to feel. How can you manage that attorney's oversized ego when you're doing an allocation, perhaps, with multi-party defendants and make it work? So sometimes it's just such a subtle strategic thing that you are taking in as the mediator and figuring out how to balance. And maybe AI will get there. That would be wonderful. But initially, I see that as something that we still will need the human touch. Can I, can I comment on that mm -hmm. uh, with respect? Because I do a fair amount of the abuse <laughs> cases too with individuals and so on. And I will often meet with people in advance. I did that pre-pandemic and I, uh, in wrongful death cases as well. It's, it's a matter of them getting to know that human being. And it's really a question of, can you put up enough of an avatar that will be able to connect with people's emotions mm -hmm. in those cases? I think that's part of, you know, can you just oh, yeah. have a questionnaire? Then they're going to game the avatar, I think. So yeah. well, I'll be curious to see. Yeah. Well, it's a really important question. Thank you for asking it, Tom. It's, it's really the, the issue of the day that all of us are now wondering about. Um, other questions? Right. Yes. Um, my name is Jenna Kelleher. I'm a research attorney at GDK West, so I think a part of my job is just being a professional observer. And so to me, I, I think shadowing presents this great opportunity both in arbitration and mediation, but I was wondering if any of the panelists felt the same way or had any thoughts on shadowing as part of your practices. I think um, if I can start the conversation, I brought shadowing to jams when we did the merger because in those days, nobody thought it appropriate. But what life is, uh, learning is experiential, we know. And I could sit in front of a room of general counsel and give a great talk about the benefits of mediation for an hour and move the needle slightly. 
but when I would invite them to come into the room in a case that they were not involved with and sort of be an inter a disinterested observer, and they could see us go from this sort of initial starting point to where we hopefully would get at the end of the day, you had true believers. They'd experienced that learning. And so we found shadowing was just one of the absolute best opportunities uh, for a variety of, of viewpoints for people who wanted to be mediators to come into the room and sit and sort of see the skills actually play out in real time but also for those people you were trying to sell on the concept, because if you could get them in the room and experience that, there was no substitute. I just have to say, Bruce, I think 25 years ago, you were very generous and allowed me to shadow you. So I knew what a master mediator was and <laughs> tried. So it was, it was a wonderful opportunity. If you have that opportunity, take advantage of it. Now, now Ruth, do you see a lot of that in the arbitration space though? Um, and it's a little harder because um, we have so many protective orders and yeah. privacy concerns. Um, but, you know, they're, the law firms bring lots of people. Um, they're, in a sense, shadowing. Um, it, it's, it's a little, I, I don't have the request for it mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. But um, I was going to suggest another uh, topic for we look to the future, because Hero, you and I did a program recently yes. on international law, on uh, on uh, the trend in international law of um, of <coughs> settlement uh, and mediation during the course of the arbitration, because arbitrations, at least here domestically, are just as I said, so litigious. Um, but we know in the rest of the world, there are different cultures that might take time out for mediation or there are judges that talk settlement. Are, it's just a whole different culture and atmosphere and maybe a better process than what we have. So we're learning from it. And maybe when it just gets too expensive, we used to say arbitration was uh, less expensive, more efficient. I don't know that that's true anymore. It's expensive. You get a panel of three arbitrators who charge uh, as much as the lawyers or probably a fraction of what the lawyers are charging these days, but still a lot of money. And so that trend of um, not mixing the two, but uh, interweaving them at appropriate uh, timeframes during the arbitration might be a trend we see. Any experience with any of that or? I just want to add on shadowing. Um, I think shadowing is fabulous. I feel like I've done it my whole career because I've participated in mediations, but um, I've had associates and other people in my firm that asked to shadow and it's so easy on Zoom, right? You just, I do a lot of pre-mediation uh, phone calls and so I'll get um, everyone's permission to allow my associate or whoever it is to shadow and they always say yes because it's a learning experience and then it's just very easy to manipulate on zoom to have them go with you as a co-host and i think as you've talked about ruth and hero that and bruce that the advantages of shadowing are great because you get to see it in action and you get to see style so you know if any of you in the room want to shadow you have some wonderful people up here just to ask it's challenging though sometimes to get permission I think from people, the participants to agree to you having a shadow. I mean, I ask sometimes and they just are like, mm, it changes the dynamic. It's another face in the room. They don't know who to, particularly when it's in person, they're sort of torn on who they should be looking at and addressing. And the person, you have to kind of establish how, what are your ground rules on that? I mean, and, and just agreement about it. How should the shadow deflect? when people ask for their opinion or their feedback, if it's something that maybe they shouldn't be, it's not a co-mediation, there's a difference. And, and that, that it's a matter of sort of how do you work with people and they wanna know how's it going to work. And I agree with Deborah that on Zoom, it's a lot easier. You can have the person uh, keep their camera off if you really don't want it to influence things and they'll feel less so. And you can even have people hide non-video participants so that, the camera off person, their name doesn't even appear on the screen. So it can really be a fly on the wall. And it, it, I think it then changes the dynamic less. Let me ask you about other um, ways that people can get more experience. So people who are thinking about making that transition, 
Um, how do they actually get cases, uh, real life cases under their belt uh, that they can then use to kind of promote their practice? So Bruce and um, uh, Rachel, you're a little bit of a unicorn, I think in a way, because you, you did it backwards, as you said, you actually went after paid clients and didn't do the traditional kind of you know court panels that a lot of us are used to. The arbitration space is also slightly different. Uh, Deborah, you were talking about the MSCs and I think Marin County. Are there some concrete tips that you can give to people about panels that they can try sure. joining and so on? So I've been doing <clears throat> panels as others in this room for at least 20, 30 years. Um, I've done, San Francisco has changed a lot of its programs. They used to have a, a you know, non-binding judicial arbitration panel. So I've done arbitrations for 20 years for them. Um, you, you go to the various courts, perhaps in the jurisdiction where you're practicing, if you're an attorney, Alameda, wherever it is, and you find out who their ADR department is and what their rules are on getting on. So I've been on the Marin County board, for example, at least 20 years before I was even interested in being a full-time mediator, just because I wanted to give back and it was what I did pro bono. And so um, San Francisco, I know Sanford and I did it and it might be a closed panel now, but you just reach out to the ADR department. Um, you can ask you know, anyone here if we have, like I can give you the email addresses, for example, of who I contact and you just get on their list. And then sometimes they will have you choose like every for six months, like how many you want to do. And um, it's just a good way to try out things, get some skill behind you. Um, so when I started doing mediations more in earnest, I might have signed up for a few more a month, and that gives you an opportunity to see other counsel and they can see you in action. You can get rid of some of your jitters and anxiety about how is this going to work, uh, and you get to actually put it in action and start building your practice from there. So I'd say go on to your local court website get on an ADR panel, federal has it as well, a really good program and start doing that before you go out. Cause you also want to have some experience. Do you want to say anything about that? Okay. No. <laughs> okay. It's the penultimate question where the rubber meets the road in our profession. How do you get the first, you know, uh, entree into the room? And it's a long involved answer, but it's it's obviously about perseverance. Many of the colleagues have given you some good uh, suggestions already. Um, I'll, um, once you do get in the room and obviously have the highest level of skills to demonstrate, don't overlook the ability to sort of use people that have gone through the experience to your advantage going forward. Forward. So, for example, yeah, those that first time to get in the room is a challenge in and of itself, and there's a variety of ways to try and accomplish that. Once you have a couple of those opportunities, don't overlook go circling back to those people who are fresh, have fresh in mind the experience they just went through with you. So when we used to say uh, we'd call somebody up who is an insurance adjuster and say, you know, you had a good experience. We were successful. Um, do you think others in your uh, company might benefit from uh, knowing more about this process? We'd love to just come in and talk with you over lunch. Uh, what have you. Maybe you can introduce us to a few other people. In other words, you're sort of pulling on threads. I'll give you one other example. One of the very first cases I mediate came about as a result of giving a talk to a group of general counsel. And afterwards, the associate general counsel for a large farm equipment manufacturing company came up and said, this process has a lot of potential for us. I want to talk to you about it. And gave me an opportunity to mediate. And 20 years later, I could trace back cases that still emanated from that conversation, meaning he would give me a case to mediate. I'd introduce myself to the other side. I'd fly to some different place. We'd mediate that lawyer in that community would then call me up two years later and say, I've got a different kind of case and so on. And it's really about just following those threads, but it all started with somebody that sort of had experience with you in the room and sort of had that deep connection as opposed to you just knocking on doors. But you do have to, back to the hero's original question, Question. You have to set goals for yourself that are ac accountable. We say to people as we've trained hundreds of mediators, uh, two or three times a week, you want to be in front of people. 
what does that mean? Like Ruth was saying, or Deborah, Rachel, it doesn't necessarily mean you're there with a brown bag lunch, but you're in some thought leadership moment. You're like, you're talking to them. You're writing a blog that they're reading. You're giving them some kind of uh, update on what's happening in the mediation community or some other way, making that connection. And the more you can be in front of people in that fashion and sort of position yourself to be someone that is available and knowledgeable in those moments of need, the phone will start ringing. It's just that simple. But those are some thoughts. The experience piece. I mean, I, I know we have people here who are from outside of the Bay Area. And um, I've mentored folks across the country who want to be mediators and have encountered some of the impediments that they've got in their local community about having opportunities in the Bay Area and in California overall, at least in the urban areas, there's a real richness of opportunities. So for instance, Alameda County, you can't get on the court mediation panel where people just pick your name to mediate a case until you have experience. But Alameda County has what's called the day of court program. It's not a pro tem program. And they offer people the opportunity to work on uh, small claims, unlawful detainer. And I was lucky. Unlawful detainer started in 2015, a year after I became a mediator. And somebody called me up and said, do you want to give back? You know, are, you doing, are you doing any pro bono? And I got into that. And that is what led to my landlord tenant niche as well, is people encountered me there. And then they went, oh, you know. You're, you're kind of good at this. Maybe I'll use you on the commercial ones. And so, but it's rare sometimes for the pro bono stuff to convert to paid. But what you have in that is time in the pilot seat. And you also have people who, when a question goes out to their list serve, they will say things like, oh, I had them here. And then somebody who is doing paying work will use you. But I still have people who are contacting me for free mediation on extremely complicated eviction cases. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you got to go through the court to get me for free. Now, Contra Costa has the settlement mentor program. Again, that's different than the court panel. So you have to sort of ask those of us who are local, and we can tell you where the places where you can get the experience that then gets you enough cases under your belt to be able to then go and be on a panel that might actually result in paid work. But it also is about, I mean, a lot of what Bruce is talking about is the get famous thing. It's that people amplify. I mediated a case last week with an attorney who said, you know, I've been trying to use you for seven years. This is our first mediation together. He learned about it. First time I'd ever, I'd, I'd never met him before. Somebody who knew me was in the gallery during you know, like one of these cattle call case management conference things. And this, these folks were ordered to mediate a coverage case. And somebody in the gallery got up and as this guy's leaving the courtroom and says, you know, Rachel Ehrlich is a coverage mediator. You should use her. And he wrote down my name. And for seven years, <laughs> he was trying to use me on a case. And finally, somebody else said yes. So, you know, it's that that they are your it's it's everybody who, you know, becoming that amplification bullhorn about your services. Um, but ultimately, it's also about how do you do as a mediator? So there's there's other stuff. And on the arbitration front, fee arbitration. I think that's time and grade, you know, on the fee arb stuff. And, you know, that's sort of waning, but it's still there. And I think it really teaches you if you do some of the panel stuff, you can work with people who are doing it to give back and you get somebody who's the umpire on it, who's leading the panel and you can learn more about it and you can decide if you like it or not. I didn't. Went, mm -mm, I don't want to do arbitration. You know? I was just going to add, you see, like with Rachel, who was in the coverage industry and uh, Jebra, who was in the uh, PI mal medical malpractice industry, have transitioned their practices to being full time mediators. And so, as I said earlier, for it's hard for a law school graduate just out, just with the diploma to, to set up the shingle go into, uh, you know, work at a law firm or something that uses mediation or arbitration so you can get some training from the advocate 
uh, side, do some pro bono uh, mediations. They're community organizations that require, you know, need mediators. I said the financial industry used to have that opportunity. Uh, shadow people if you can. Uh, develop your practice again, or, or at least your persona or your reputation by getting involved in all the uh, professional groups. And soon you'll build step by step, you'll be able to um, pursue a full time career in ADR. Thank you. And on that note, uh, our time is up. So please join me in thanking our panelists for today. <laughs> We'll come back by at 10.45 for the second panel. <laughs> well, who we'll put this panel together? Yeah, yeah, did. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last panel had three women. <laughs> That's fair. Okay, thank you for coming back and joining us. Welcome. I know it is hard to stop mingling. That is the best part and most fun of these things. So there'll be more of that afterwards while lunching. So I hope you're all staying for that part, portion. So uh, for this panel, we're talking about kind of where we've been. It's a little bit of history, what we're doing, where we might go. We're interested in hearing from you all as well about the future of the center. Um, we have our new-ish director. Um, so he also is curious about like, you know, what's gonna matter moving forward as a center. Um, so I'll introduce myself again. I'm Maddie Robertson. I am the deputy director of the Center for Negotiation and Dispute Resolution. I am also an alum. I graduated about a decade ago, a little bit more, and I worked out in the field. I became a mediator. I was inspired by taking the mediation clinic while I was here. And so I became a mediator and I worked in community mediation in the courts. Um, I did a lot of program management, running different dispute resolution programs, uh, various organizations. And then I came back here to be the deputy director. And I've recently started teaching our mediation clinic in this like big, perfect, full circle moment. Uh, and so I've been fortunate to have, you know, lots of different connections to school and in the world. And so I'm very honored to be able to have a talk today with um, some of our professors and some of our current students, which is always really fun. So um, I will give them each the floor to kind of give, you know, the brief introduction of themselves, kind of who they are, their connection. And then we're going to have a bit more of like a conversational uh, topic today. So we invite you at any point if you have questions or thoughts to join in the conversation with us. Um, so we'll just go down the line. I'll who's sitting next to me. So please introduce yourself. Thank you, Maddie. So I'm Howard Herman, um, and hmm. I have, I'm a 1983 Hastings grad. Um, <laughs> um, when there were no dispute resolution courses offered at this uh, institution uh, at all. Um, I think I might be the longest serving adjunct teaching dispute resolution classes um, at, at UC Law. Um, and uh, I began teaching here in 1986, teaching negotiation skills classes. Um, and I've taught many different courses over the, uh, over the years um, uh, leading up to the creation of the center and then um, since the center has been involved. Um, so that's uh, negotiation, the mediation class, the mediation clinic. And for the last number of years, um, I've taught a, core, a sh pretty short course called Effective Representation in Mediation, which is focused on, uh, on teaching law students um, about how advocacy in mediation looks different from, adv uh, from advocacy in other settings. Um, my day job is that I am a full-time mediator at JAMS, um, uh, where I've been for the last three years or so. Um, before that, um, most of my background is um, in mediating at and running court ADR programs. Um, I was the director of the ADR program at the US District Court here in San Francisco for 23 years. Before that, I was the director of ADR programs in Co at Contra Costa Superior Court. And I got my start mediating at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in the earliest iteration of what's now the um, Ninth Circuit's um, mediation um, uh, program in its really early stages uh, in the late 1980s and early 19 um, early 1990s. Okay. Uh, hello, I am Clint Wassett. Um, 
And uh, I'll start with how I usually start my introduction in my classes, which is to joke that I this year uh, will be a 23L. Uh, <laughs> and the reason I make that joke is because I have never left Hastings to UC uh, Law SF uh, at any time during the, the course of my career, which I'll talk about. So I was here as a student from 01 to 04, where uh, I was on the first negotiation teams that we had. Um, with my coach, Chris Knowlton, who was also one of the co-founders of CNDR, who I think we we, we did not uh, mention here, but I was here prior to CNDR starting. Um, much like you're about to hear from these students, uh, was the kind of student who wanted to take every class that there was. And prior to the center, we were probably in a middle ground transition there. So I took, uh, there's only three or four classes I could take before going on to um, externships at jams and things like that. But I took B, I had B. Moulton as my first professor for negotiation. Um, and Joe Carrillo for my mediation professor. Um, and then from there, um, it became a professor here at UC Hastings in 2007, where I've taught lots of different classes um, also. So in everything, including the regular mediation class, negotiation, the advanced negotiation class, uh, which are the, the two or three that I circulate a lot with now. And then things that are technically classes, but are more extracurricular. And I think what I'm best known for here at, at Hastings uh, is being the, the director of the negotiation and dispute resolution team, which I've been doing ever since, uh, well, it's hard. This is where, where, where the 23 L kicks in because I was on the first teams as a student, um, came back. So that's 2001 to 2004, uh, then was a coach for 2005 and six, and then was hired as professors to, in 2007. And then since 2007 have been, uh, kind of the head coach there. So we can talk more about the team a little bit later. Because um, that's a big chunk, I think, of of, uh, of the history of the of the center uh, in lots of ways, and certainly an important part of uh, of my career. Um, I also teach negotiation at uh, UC Berkeley Law, um, and then my day job. I have a couple of different day jobs as well. <laughs> my day job, my main day job, is I'm the head of business development at uh, Zynga, which is a mobile games company that you could have heard of. We are famous for making words with friends and Farmville. So those are usually people's touch points, but we are also the mobile division um, for a bigger video game publisher called Take-Two Interactive, uh, which is a company that's responsible for Grand Theft Auto as maybe their most famous game, but lots of different games. So we're about a $20 billion company. We are responsible for about a little over half the business on the mobile side. Uh, and I head up the business development wing there where I am non-practicing Definite, uh, definitely negotiating commercial contracts and negotiating uh, commercial partnerships. So everything I do for fun <laughs> or for work has to comes back to negotiation, dispute resolution, uh, etc. And I will pass. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Baez. I am currently a 3L in the last few days before graduation. Um, before law school, I was litigation paralegal for about five years at a plaintiff side um, civil litigation firm. Um, so fortunately, while there, I got to work on a number of mediations and that kind of started to spark my interest in ADR in general. Um, and then here at school, I was uh, fortunate enough to take the mediation clinic, um, which was one of my favorite classes ever and really got me um, thinking of a career in the field. Um, so I'll be graduating with, with uh, the concentration in civil litigation and alternative dispute resolution. I've been fortunate enough to take classes with everybody up here and I'm um, looking forward to sharing more about my experience today. And I should mention, I did take the mediation clinic when I was here and Howard was my professor. Uh, <laughs> so uh, me as well, I've also taken classes with everyone up here. <laughs> uh, hi everybody, uh, my name's Ari. Like Casey, I'm a real as well, we're just about done. Um, and I came to the CNDR department actually after meeting Sheila on a Zoom call in one of my first couple of weeks when they introed all the students to what uh, UC Law now uh, could be. And I, and I remember thinking very clearly that, wow, uh, there's actually a way that we can resolve uh, arguments rather than just sort of argue about them endlessly, which is what I kind of came to law school kind of thinking was sort of what the plan for uh, the education model was. And so I was really impressed with that. And so uh, I kind of dove all the way into uh, the ADR program. And so it, like Casey, I've taken a bunch of almost, <laughs> I think all of the classes that are available uh, here through, uh, through the school uh, and just have really kind of uh, and and uh, was a member of the ADR team for essentially the whole time as well. And and I have, um, and so I guess my comment here is I really just kind of want to indicate how 
uh, how sort of formative this group uh, really was on my idea of what it means to be a practicing uh, attorney moving forward. And so it kind of changed uh, the way that I, I looked at uh, the legal profession generally. And so uh, I, the reason I'm here is really just to pay big deference and respect to a lot of the mentors who I've met along the way and, and Rachel and like all along the way, a huge mentor at the mediation clinic. And, and there's a lot of you here and I'm just really excited to kind of get a chance to talk to you guys and, and let you know what it's sort of been like for the three years uh, that I've been here and, uh, you know, under these, some of these guys. So and Maddie, I'll pass it back to you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so perhaps because we're celebrating it's 20 years this year and we have a former director here as well, we could start with talking about like, you know, our, our directors and the people and the wonderful many adjuncts we've had and kind of what they they bring to the center. Sure. So I can I can kind of start, sort of start there. So like there's a lot of, uh, you know, really. Uh, I, so, Maddie, your question is that uh, is what the directors are doing to. to yeah, the directors them. and the professor and the kind of the role they're playing in the center and for the students. Yeah, I mean, so like I said, it sort of had a transformative effect on how I looked at the legal practice generally. Like I said, I came here sort of thinking that uh, the law school was designed and, and, and sort of had the effect of teaching people how to argue and in order to maximize their billable hours. Um, and that's not really what I wanted. I wanted to try to figure out, uh, as I heard some of the panel saying earlier, right? It was like, how do you demonstrate good judgment? How do you learn how to reflect good judgment? And the ADR program, I think, uh, really does a good job of strengthening those skills. And so each of the directors and the, and the professors that I've met along the way have, uh, in my view, really demonstrated some of those skills that I want to reflect uh, moving forward into my into my practice in the future is how do you demonstrate uh, how to make good decisions, not only just uh, at the negotiation table, but within your practice, in your life as a human, um, how do you make the right decision? Um, and, and some of the skills that, uh, that uh, Clint and, and Hero and Maddie and, and, and Howard teach us is like how to evaluate some of those, uh, those problems that we face and how to make good decisions. So anyway, I'll, I'll turn it over. <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, one of um, my favorite things about everybody in the uh, program and the faculty in general is um, just how much professional engagement that we've had. Everybody is so open to talking. I know I've come to visit everybody in office hours to talk about career advice and everything. Um, maybe not something I would have done in undergrad, but here, you know, I really <laughs> took the opportunity and everybody has been so helpful and just open um outside of that uh you know everybody here has wonderful careers so in most of the classes we've had um some great speakers come whether they have their own solo practice or um you know whatever they are doing uh we've we've had uh, through through professor hermit's class we were able to have some uh real mediators come in and so we could do simulated mediations with them so just the level of um hands-on experience with with people actually practicing in the field and getting to meet them and um just like all of you today i'm sure i'll come bother you over by the snacks later but um just that and all of the engagement has been really really my favorite part and so i'll try to speak from both sides of here because one of the important things in thinking about the 20 years of the center since i uh, was here prior to that and sort of been here that that whole time um the the director when i started was chris knowlton um or by my 3l year chris nolton had, had and, and working with most of had opened the center and she was the the first director she was also my negotiation team coach um so she was very influential for me and i, I ari and i are going to end up saying a lot of the same things i think <laughs> we've talked about this uh over the last three years that we've known each other but i was very much in his shoes in terms of my level of interest um and how adr thinking about adr negotiation changed what I thought I was going to do in law school. So I definitely came into law school thinking, you know, as a, as a philosophy major, leaning towards the law, thinking that, hey, I'm good at winning arguments. So shouldn't I go to law school to figure out how to, to kind of do that? And then as soon as I got here, I just think I saw something in the substance of ADR that to me felt like the actual resolution of a problem. Um, and maybe that's the, the overly philosophic part of me thought that that was the correct way to be counsel. Uh, for somebody. And so I just, I just kind of, you know, glommed onto that. And Chris was very instrumental in kind of making me see that first from being the first, while we were trying to figure out what 
a negotiation team was and what it meant and what did it mean to do a good, good job in negotiation, right? How, how can you have negotiation, even mediation as a contest, right? What does that look like? And she was really instrumental in just um, kind of helping guide during that process, give us really good feedback, uh, but also to help kind of shape careers. So I did work with her. She, she had a very robust, she, I, I just, I, I, I looked up to her quite a lot. I remember at the time she was being courted by jams and she used to tell me, oh, I can't work for jams. They can't pay me enough. Um, and I remember she just had a quite a robust, uh, quite a robust and interesting practice where she was doing lots of interesting mediation and arbitration work in the entertainment field. Uh, I got to clerk for her and work for her over different summers uh, and, and really see into how practical application of these things like we were learning in terms of um, not really only considering positions and only considering leverage, but bringing things like interests and other things into the mix for consideration, had a practical outcome for real business situations uh, that, that happened in real life. Um, and then she was the person who gave me the chance uh, to teach at a, you know, what I thought was a very young age, since like Howard and I had the same kind of gap, maybe three years <laughs> out of law school. And for me, I was, uh, I think I was, I was 29 on the day that I got hired as a, as a professor. Um, and to just have the insight to see that I would have the, the capability to kind of put together curriculum and, and kind of keep the ball moving forward was an opportunity that I'm really thankful for in, in the, uh, in the time since. So since then, uh, it caused me on my career path, uh, to not only develop and kind of build out from some of the initial skills we learned to make, you know, hopefully my classes be engaging and come at negotiations from a, a, a much different and more complicated angle than I think people would anticipate but then also in my own career to to make to just shape the way that i took it and, and kind of make use of it so for me now um i i do i do not i mean i'm certainly not a practicing attorney um and i don't consider but i don't consider myself not to be a lawyer uh, i just think that building out business relationships and, and in figuring out how to use the moving parts of contracts is my favorite way to use the legal knowledge that I have. And it's turned out that I've been good at that. And I, I think all of that is owed back to, um, uh, to, to the center. And one of the aspects of, I think I talked about having two different jobs. I may have only mentioned one. The second, the second job that I have is heading up um, a nonprofit organization called EMI Foundation, which is really dedicated to helping other schools and other academic programs sort of have any sort of semblance organization of what we have here at CNDR, because in my time um, as a negotiation coach, and again, I will talk about that through the team at some point, um, we get a lot of exposure to different schools and what sort of passes for legal edu for ADR education at certain schools. And it's, it's, um, you know, some of it harkens back to, you know, people talking about, hey, in the 80s, even in the 90s, we didn't have classes. But what I see that passes for classes at certain schools compared to what we're used to is, is quite disappointing. Um, if I'm being frank. Uh, so, so I, I think it's important to try to help these different schools understand what's possible in curriculum and understand how to, to um, organize those things from scratch. And also if they need funding or they need people to volunteer to help kind of arrange that. So that's another piece of what I've sort of taken on is I think there's a model in what CNDR does that's uh, that's good. There's lots of things we could talk about for improving it, and it, everything could always be better. But there's also another, and there's a, also an element of it that it's been a little bit of an embarrassment of riches in the sense that there are some schools that have nothing, and they still, 35, 40 years later, have nothing. And so it's really, it's really, um, uh, you know, thinking about how to to kind of share that in expertise and knowledge. So that's become basically my life's mission, I guess, is is using these teams as uh, a mechanism and a vehicle to kind of getting people to have really good hands-on practice, taking my own career and sort of exploring uh, in really uh, complex business situations, uh, the, the highest level of application of these principles. And then third, uh, helping build that out so that, that there will be, what we're doing here will become the norm and we can actually sort of rise, raise all the boats together. So that's, that's you know, in a nutshell, my approach. So many, I want to just, um... Um, mention a few more names because of Please. people who are really who have been really important <clears throat> um, in the history of the center. And I want to go back to um, a name that was mentioned, Melissa Nelkin, um, because uh, Professor Nelkin um, was really the she and Maud Previer were the first two professors here at Hastings who began teaching classes in negotiation. 
And this is the Center for Negotiation and Dispute Resolution. The negotiation is really where it began. Um, and Maud and Melissa were the two people who designed the first classes that were taught here um, on negotiation and provided the germ for everything else that, 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 um, that, that flows. Um, and I, when, when Maud left um, and went over to Stanford to start its program there, and she was the founding director of that, of the Center for Negotiation at Stanford, um, um, I basically inherited Maud's class and Maud and Melissa gave me their, syllab their syllabi and in, in order to develop what the negotiation class would, would look like. Um, and then that moved ultimately to Melissa um, hiring Chris Knowlton to start, the, to, to get the center going. Um, so, so I just wanna call them out as we think about the 20 years. After Chris, um, I think there was a period where um, Melissa was interim director, but the next director was Grand Lum, um, who was not here for as long as some of the other um, as some of the other directors. But Grand is a person of um, really great um, vision and foresight. He now works um, with politicians. His, his current project is to be working with politicians in Washington, um, trying to bridge some of the um, divides that are um, that 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 exist um, with it, with elect, among the elected officials in Congress. Um, we're talking about a person of real stature. And then Grand was followed by Sheila, who's in the room, um, who really saw the the oversaw the um, the just a, a, a blossoming of the center um, and its, um, uh, it, its uh, entry into the dispute resolution world internationally um, and, and uh, guided um, an expansion into programs beyond just the students um, here at the school, um, but out in the community as well. Um, and, um, and I think that the center's success um, is really about the quality of all those individuals who served, who have served in that director role. And fortunately, we have Hero coming in um, on, on, you know, uh, on the shoulders of all of these really giants in our in, in in the field of dispute resolution. So I just didn't want your question to be to, to miss um, the the personal qualities of all those individuals who are what I think has made the center um, what what it is. I was counting on you to actually say all that, Howard. So thank okay. you. Yeah, <laughs> I set you up for that. Um, and I was hired by Sheila to be her deputy director when I started here. And I feel really fortunate that I did get to work with her before she retired and to see uh, the kindness that she brought to this community to like bring people together. Sheila is a great connector of people um, and to to really build that feeling between the students and the professionals and the professors that like we are part of this bigger thing um, was very inspiring for me. So that was, you know, a huge uh moment for me when I came in to feel like, oh, this is a wonderful place and I want to be a part of its continued growth to provide this, you know, community and like professional training for people who are go into the world. Um, and so it's been really special to see how we can help develop students into professionals. You know, they're not all going to be mediators, but they will all negotiate. They will all use these skills. These are valuable. So uh, I do think, yes, the center is its people, right? Could. Yes, I mean, Rachel. I, I think Maddie's been uh, a bit shy <laughs> because her work with San Mateo Superior in terms of putting students there is an outgrowth of her community background with seeds, putting people in Alameda County Superior with small claims court. And she serves currently with me, so this is why I know this, on the ADR admin committee for the Alameda County Superior Court. And her perspective that it, it puts the center not just in this inward focused training thing, it's actually part of our EDR community in the Bay Area, that it's more than the community-based organizations, and also it feeds into our court system as well. So it ties into what the school does in producing litigators too, and is peacemaking amongst obviously self-represented parties in the court system. So I do want to call that out as a 
Thank you. You're making me blush. That's very kind. Uh, yes. And that has been, I think, a part of my professional growth is like joining committees and connecting with others, um, doing things like this and getting to know all these wonderful people. Um, and yeah, that's part of, you know, we talk about the Sheila legacy is I want to do that too. I want to be a connector and bring people together and work with others. That's actually a good segue for us. We have a lot of partners that we work with at the center. Um, so we have the San Mateo Superior Court, where we do small claims mediations through a mediation clinic that I teach. Um, and we have uh, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing and um, the Human Rights Commission. We do mediations through them. Those are partners. They've been around for a long time. Um, JAMS and the Northern District, they host our students to observe mediations, which, you know, we're talking about shadowing in the last panel. That's really valuable for students to see those professional mediations because our students are working with mostly unrepresented clients or they're doing simulations where it's just other students. And so for them to see how things are in the real world, which is a different model we're teaching them who, you know, haven't been in, you know, experienced the, you know, the same way for them to see these things. Uh, so maybe all of you could talk about, you know, those partnerships, those relationships, what they've, what they've been or what they've meant to us. I can, I can start with a little bit of that actually. So, and I see Michael here in the, in the room, Michael is uh, also another student who's involved in the, in the mediation clinic uh, and, and the mediation clinic that Maddie sort of talked about, put students at the court every week, uh, multiple times a week. And the only reason that there's a mediation program there at all uh, is because of some of the good work that the CNDR department is, is putting in uh, to actually put students in the mediation chair uh, to be able to actually talk to adverse parties and get them to uh, a mediated settlement. And the semester this year, and I'm a TA for that this uh, this cycle. The the, the season this uh, semester is doing great, and in fact, uh, I think the their their settlement rate is like over it's like ninety percent for you guys. Uh, they're doing great, and and Maddie, you're 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 killing it there too. Thank um, you. Helping students to kind of figure out how to actually talk to adverse parties. It's a it's a it's a challenge, I think, for students to figure out how to actually put themselves uh, in a uh, in a conversation with two parties who actually have a conflict rather than just sort of simulate that conversation in a classroom between two students who kind of theoretically have the interests uh, in their minds. But when you're actually sort of put into that, I'll, I'll call it a hot seat, I think the dynamic changes and you can only really get that experience, I would say, uh, when you're actually sort of put into that position. And so, uh, and, and if you have questions about that too, or you want to draw that out, like I'm happy to talk about that more too. But, but yeah, the only reason we, we, we really get that practical experience um, is because of the relationships and the network, the networks that have been built out in the community. And that's an important part of CNDR yeah. too. So. And shout out to Sheila for putting us in <laughs> yeah. connection with San Mateo to build out that mediation program. We essentially are the mediation program for the right. small claims. <laughs> the only reason it exists, if, if the students are not there at the courthouse mediations do not happen. Yeah, I'll keep going off that. I um, also did the clinic for me. I'm um, born and raised and I still live in San Mateo. Um, so being able to have the opportunity to be involved in San Mateo small claims court was um, just kind of felt like home and giving back to the community that I really love. Um, also through the clinic in general, um, it's a bit of a smaller class, so it's um, more of like an intimate setting. You really get to know every single person in there when you do the mediations, or even before you do the mediations, we're doing, you know, role plays and simulations and learning about all the different types of mediation, um, you know, on the spectrum from more facilitative to the evaluative style, um, you know, learning tips to break the impasse and, and, and um, having all of that knowledge and then going into the mediation was just really fun and exciting process. You get to see what works, take notes on, you know, what's what keeps working and maybe things to avoid um, for next time. But also um, the experience of being able to do it at, um, with a co-mediator, um, getting to see everybody in classes style and, and things that they bring to the table. And then towards the end, getting to do it solo was just a, a really um, great process. Uh, <clears throat> so for me, I'll echo just again, I'll, I'll tap back into the student thing as I want to do because uh, I did take the mediation clinic when I was here, was my favorite class and I always recommend it to all students at, as such, right? So when I was here at Hastings, it was definitely my favorite class and kind of the best practical experience that I had 
uh, in the classroom setting. So uh, that's quite valuable. And uh, I, I'm, I'm curious always to know more about how it shifted and changed to to see what it looks like. Um, and, uh, and for us, it was, it was a local court. It was literally just the court uh, across the street. So that was great. Um, the second thing I was able to do, and because I was in the, sh the shoes of, uh, of these guys when, before CNDR existed, I, I quickly exhausted all the classes that we had. Um, and so was fortunate enough to, uh, to work with uh, Martin Quinn from JAMS, who was a professor here at the time. Uh, who, according to what he told me uh, back in 2003, 2004, I was the first ever intern that JAMS allowed. Uh, I'm not sure if that's continued, so I might be the only one. I might have ruined it for everyone else. Um, but I, so that was kind of an independent study class that Martin had arranged, and I got to go shadow every aspect of the of the of all the JAMS processes, which includes the the case management side, arbitration, mediation. And it was quite a bit of access and quite a long, um, quite a long route. I, I know that it, it spanned two different semesters. And basically, a couple of days a week, I was getting to go in uh, and watch either a complete arbitration or a complete mediation from start to finish, uh, work behind the scenes. And a few of the times, which was which was great, and I'm not sure how ethical it was, but. Uh, uh, some of the the GMs mediators would just ask me what I thought as an observer because when I was observing, I was just sitting at the table. So it was kind of a, a maybe, and maybe you know, I don't know how. I mean, it sounds like shadowing's been happening forever, but every now and then I got to chime in uh, during the mediation. So massively invaluable experience. I remember being very uh, envious of all the people who worked at GMs and and thinking about how to kind of build a career out from that. But that was that was uh, that was very. Um, uh, influential to me. And then uh, working with the team now, uh, I mentioned, you know, it's, it's this is a little complicated. I guess it's a it's a nonprofit I started, but lots of the people that I work with through my nonprofit uh, are, are practitioners in the negotiation and mediation side who want to come back and uh, who have experience um, with with uh, ADR and negotiation teams as a vehicle for learning about this. And I think the idea of the vehicle, and again, I, I assume I'll expand on this a little bit more, but it's it's really um, in-depth ensconcement into some kind of negotiation or mediation problem for a, quite a long time. Uh, but there's lots of people who are passionate about that who come back to give um, uh, advice to people and coach people, which, you know, uh, I'll, I'll maybe earmark this to talk about as well, but the difference between being a professor and a coach is an interesting one that I've wrestled with over the years. Um, but really coming back to coach people and then helping provide um, career opportunities for students who feel like a lot of the students feel, which is, you know, we have this panel from the first time, hey, how can I get a mediation um, career started? And, and the answer is that it's, it's hard, right? And it takes a long time and there's all these different paths. I definitely went down that particular road, and it's really nice to be in a position where some of those, some of that path is now built out, um, where you can um, assist. And so I think that's been a those three kind of groups are something that I can speak to. Um, I, I want to say a few words about the value of the partnership from the other side, um, uh, from being at the court and being in partnership with CNDR. Um, and the, the value that that had um, on, uh, uh, from the other angle. Um, I, we agreed at the court to offer up um, the, the possibility for observations because it also was beneficial to the panelists to have that exposure to the students, to hear what's, what's going on. It's not just about, give, it wasn't only about giving back, it was also about um, what we got um, as, a, as an institution back from, from CNDR. And in, in that way, I think it really was um, a partnership. I love having observers in my mediation. Um, and while I don't ever ask them to speak, and I have a very strong rules about them not speaking when they're at the table, I do 
almost always, I mean, I do always talk with the observer, you know, as I'm moving from room to room in a caucus. Um, I want that feedback. That's an extra set of eyes and ears about what's happening in the case. It's really valuable to the mediators to have the fresh perspective that students who are immersed in studying this right now might bring. So while I wouldn't let you ever talk in the mediation Good class, choice. Choice. <laughs> um, if you're just an observer, that process of shadowing is really valuable on the other side as well. So there are real, it's, it really is a mutual um, a, a mutual benefit. I also want to talk about um, a, a benefit that derives from what some folks have been saying about the clinic, um, and and what and and uh, what I personally and the court got from the mediation clinic. So when I was teaching the mediation clinic, um, one of the things that happens in the clinic is that there is a, a, a very robust debriefing process that happens where, um, in, as a part of that clinical experience, we called it rounds. So the students would go to the, um, you know, would go mediate their cases. And then at the next class session, we'd really sort of dissect what happened. For me, some of you know that one of the things that I was very active in in the court was developing um, reflective practice groups and really promoting in the field of mediation. And this is something that's happened over the last, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. There has been a proliferation of the idea of mediators coming together um, to debrief their cases in practice groups. And I got that started at the district court and the and that idea flowed from my experience as a professor at Hastings conducting rounds in the clinic. And so it needed to be changed a bit for peer practice. Um, I wasn't the professor in the practice groups, but the but the very notion that at the district court um, we had these very robust groups of mediators who would meet to debrief their cases and try to figure it out. That came because of the, that was, that happened because of the partnership between, in, in, in some ways, between um, what was going on at CNDR and what's happening, what was happening in the, in the program. So there is a real um, way in which these kinds of, uh, of partnerships build the whole field of practice um, and, and, and CNDR plays a big role in that. And I actually, I would echo that because uh, now working in uh, mostly commercial negotiation, which has, uh, well, first of all, it has parts of every aspect of ADR because believe me, uh, dispute resolution is it plays a huge factor between uh, the egos of different companies, but also internal negotiations to get sign off um, <laughs> internally to a company for a deal that's on the table is there, but some of the things that we do, especially uh, that I've helped, I've kind of developed from my own curriculum, from being a member of the team and being a part of the team and taking all the CNDR classes and working at Jams is that we actually do some of these things that are, I think, up until then, were, were academic in terms of trying to teach people how to think about negotiation or what is it or what is mediation. And from that, you do get practices that actually work. And then you, you you can use them and they become exercises. So I definitely make use of those things on my own teams now uh, to, to practical kind of commercial effect and 100% agree. And Howard came to our class this week and spoke as a guest. So if you want to be a guest in our class, let us know. And if you are a mediator who would like to have student observers, let me know <laughs> <laughs> because we need more. We need more uh, observations. The, pandemic shifted things and now uh, we have less mediators who are willing to take student observers um, on virtually sadly and I think it's really easier that way so if you know anyone also putting a plug out for that and that that's another thing to say is that as a mediation professor that was quite useful to the class to be mm -hmm. able to have to take those observations and turn them into class discussions it's definitely a vital part so if uh, yeah if there's a way to to arrange for that it, it does really really help yeah, so uh, we talked a little bit about the clinic, which is a wonderful experience. And I am 
pro, you know, experiential learning. I think that really values the students. They sit in those doctrinal classes their entire first year and just being lectured at. So getting their hands into things is really valuable. Um, so maybe we could turn to the ADR team because that's another very experiential experience um, and just talk more about that a little bit. Yeah, so I thank you. And I, this, this is going to take a, a, a second because I, I do think that one of the things that gets missed about about thinking about the ADR team is that it's um, uh, it's quite it's it's a quite avant-garde approach to th thinking about how to get people to learn about negotiation. And I think when we think about when we think about um, and, and what I mean by that is to say if you have this shell that is performance at some level, right? And there's these aspects of competition, judges, and different things. And I guess for, fortunately or unfortunately for the students at at UC Law. Um, I'm not really interested in the performative aspect at all, right? So I definitely index on what is it that we can learn about the fundamentals of negotiation through having a platform to, to perform and break down kind of what these parts are. So essentially what we do on the negotiation team is you're given a problem in advance. You're, there's usually a confidential set of facts and um, a general set of facts that everyone can see. And then you're supposed to go through this moot situation and figure out a negotiation strategy. And then negotiations can happen either through um, business building phase, which is more like what I do. Um, they can happen or, or, or transactional. They can be um, in the litigation um, settlement phase of a discussion or just prior to that. And then there's mediation itself where the students have a chance to either work as the mediator and do the mediations um, or, or work as um, representatives within a mediation. So there's, there's three or four different aspects in there that are kind of broad stroke buckets for everybody to be. And then we can throw it then, and then we throw in all kinds of different um, uh, kind of modifiers onto that. So for example, we do a transactional competition where part of the competition is drafting a 15 page or so page section of, a, of an M&A contract that you start, you put out there as your kind of first offer that you then go through a series of red lines and only then show up and, and do a negotiation that kind of takes it through to completion. So um, you have a lot of really practical opportunities and different things that kind of come through that. The thing that's interesting about it to me and why I say it's more, uh, where, why I say it's more avant-garde is that we're, we're not trying to, while we're doing this, demonstrate or sort of virtue signal this is I'm doing interest based negotiation, right? Because I've heard of people mentioned today a couple of times in real life, people don't do interest based negotiation. I think that's probably true from an observational standpoint if you looked at volume. But what works the best negotiating does come back to being interest based. So, how can you think from a practical sense about how to take a conversation that isn't going to be interest based and turn it into one where using interest is the solution? Right, so we really, really focus on that, and part of doing that in in the field of the of the negotiation competition and the artifice of it is cutting back against everyone's preconceived notions about what what looks like the best job negotiating or what will judges think without doing a lot of analysis about what kind of what negotiation is. And in general, what we do is we just work with the students one on one. Um, looking at their problem, talking about the different strategies for how to best break down and kind of come up with a strategic plan for how to solve that problem. Think about the different branching ways that the conversation will go. Um, really get that kind of worked out and then iterate on this. So go through practice sessions where we say, okay, let's try a particular strategy and let's think about the kinds of things that might answer for that strategy and let's come back and try it again. And let's take feedback from how did this work and what were things we could do on the execution standpoint? What were things that we can do on the strategy standpoint? And going through that process over and over again in a large period of time, I think helps create, and then knowing that they'll be on stage, I think helps create for the students that sense of weight or um, immediacy that's needed and that's missing sometimes from the classes. When, when I definitely, when I teach the classes, one of the hardest things is that people get a set of facts and then, <laughs> and then it's just kind of like, hey, I'll do this tomorrow and I'm done. So that, that sticking with that kind of problem and process and being put on, on, the, on display for that, I think is, it, gives the, it gives everybody the right amount of focus. And then 
We work together for quite a long amount, amounts of time. We work with all kinds of different alumni and people who have different kind of jobs and, and different things. You can kind of come in and give different perspectives. And then ultimately, if, you, if, you, if you're like Ari and you start as a 1L, it, there's a three-year plan to sort of what your progress will look like. So generally speaking, we do start with people when they're 1Ls, we're able to sort of see where, where are their current strengths in terms of what they can do right now in negotiation and lean into those strengths and get them in a comfort zone where they can be successful. And then over time, think about, well, where are the places that they can improve and then challenge them to improve by putting them in situations where they get to do the, the, the places where they, you know, they might not have uh, as much natural skills. So it, it's really, you know, in a broad stroke sense, it's about taking the aggressive negotiators and then making sure by the time that they're done that they know how to mediate and they and they have sat in that chair and, and looked at things through that lens. And it's on the opposite side, people who are really good with the soft softer skills that might come up in mediation to teach them how to be, um, you know, to use leverage and to be, you know, to be sort of more aggressive when that's called for and to look at those things through a broad spectrum. So I, I'm really proud of the program. And I think that the reason I like it as a vehicle is because um, well, because I'm a pretty intense person and I, and I, and I like to be able to study things for quite a long period of time and, and really kind of get my hands into the dough. And I think that the team really does, <laughs> does allow for that kind of, uh, that, that kind of thing a little bit better than the classroom does. So for me, so that's, uh, that's the team in a nutshell, we've been doing this, um, for, uh, yeah, this will be our 24th season coming up. Um, and we've been we've been just quite successful despite bucking the trend of everybody else. I think the biggest pain for us is there are people who are not very good at negotiation, but think think that they should display certain things or use certain keywords. Like my interest is, and then and then sometimes judges uh, reward that kind of behavior. Right. So we've done everything that we we've accomplished everything that we've accomplished by just being better negotiators and better mediators than people. Uh, and I'm a real stickler for that aspect of it and turning off the performative aspect again, for better or, or for worse for the team, but we've been quite successful with that approach. Yeah. I, I, to be honest with you, I, I don't actually have too much to add to what Clint uh, said there. So I've been a member of the team for three years, as he mentioned. And, and, and I, I guess the only thing that I, I want to say is that uh, like we've, sort of been talking about, uh, and I've heard a whole bunch of people reference, and, and Bruce, I, I know you, you kind of bring this up too, is like that all of these skills, be, mediation begins with me, and that uh, the basis of a good judgment sort of uh, begins and ends with self-reflection. And, and I think what I heard a lot of Clint saying is like, there is a lot of uh, practical elements that go into the practice of negotiation and, and mediation and all these things. And through uh, all of these sort of, um, iterative processes that lead us to getting to the table of negotiation. We, you know, as students, uh, we learn a lot about ourselves, but then we also end up learning a lot about the fears that we go to the table with in order to complement their strengths with the strengths we bring to the table. And by kind of understanding uh, the landscape of the table and the, and the, and the people who are who are there. Um, not only have we done really well uh, professionally and, and competitively, um, but I think uh, you know the the benefit uh, from my perspective is is like a lot of the 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 most meaningful relationships that I've made uh, in law school have been a result of uh, my involvement in the CNDR uh, and the students that I worked with directly uh, as a student. Uh, you know, peer at hate at UCLSF, but then also the students that I go out and compete with uh, and compete against. Um, some of those people have become, uh, you know, my closest friends because I watched them um, do some really cool things and I filled my notebook with all, all of their successes and their strategies um, and reflected on what went well and what didn't go well uh, and then sort of bring that forward into the next uh, competition or the next negotiation or the next reflection uh, round. Um, and, and that iterative process, I think, is something that this program does really, really well that just it's kind of like, for lack of a better word, is kind of lacking from some of the other doctrinal classes where you read the statute, apply the statute, see if it uh, fits with your facts, and then move on. Um, and so I, that's something that um, I originally, like I mentioned at the very beginning here, was really attracted to and what Sheila sort of, sort of sold the program as and has carried through uh, as a truth uh, uh, for the entire three years that I've been here. And so, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a personal note, like that's the reason I plan to kind of continue being a part uh, of the CNDR program is because I think that's really valuable for students moving forward. And one thing I want to add is the, in what, it, the, what I think about it for students who are here, maybe who haven't thought about doing it. It's just, 
it, it's a little bit of projection for me with when I was a student in a negotiation class and why I think I appreciated the mediation clinic so much is that you get a problem, you have a, a short amount of time with it, you don't get a lot of feedback about how it could have gone differently, right? And it's really expanding kind of what uh, uh, the interaction that you can have for you specifically about that topic uh, in, a, in a, an otherwise a quasi classroom setting. And so I think part of the what's special about CNDR and what I'm really what I'm personally really grateful for both as a student in terms of when I got to do it and then how it shaped my career kind of going out is you know that again at the beginning with with Chris as kind of the coach she she saw the value in in putting students through these kinds of paces as a vehicle for that uh, so very grateful for for kind of her vision for that and then incredibly grateful to Sheila and I've mentioned this she and I've had private conversations about this too but to, to have the to the patience to deal with what's kind of a weird and non-standard aspect of 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 um uh non-standard classroom setting right that that we definitely do things in 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 kind of expanded non-linear ways i think that we're, yeah, <laughs> sure, sure but but i think i think it requires some some trust and some leeway that is not you know i don't know that it would be given everywhere and i think it's allowed this really special important thing to bloom uh and i think that's i've just been grateful for that I think there's a conceptual framework that this fits into that's um, that that is um, not exact. I, I don't know that I've actually heard it articulated quite this way as CNDRs, but I think it expresses what CNDR does in, in this way. It has to do with the notion that um, all of this experiential learning is about having a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset. Most of law school is about learning facts and knowing how to regurgitate them well and it's about demonstrating how smart you are and a lot of lawyering is about demonstrating how how you're the smartest person in the room and you you know you have the right answer um but um this sort of learning is about acknowledging what you don't know and being open to the idea of growth and real learning um and that that happens through experience and reflection um, and that's a whole different way than most than the way most of law school is structured. And CNDR gives it, 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 it has room for that kind of for that kind of an approach and a mindset. Um, and I think that, you know, and in my in my life, um, I uh, struggling to to maintain a growth mindset as somebody who was raised as some with, you know, with pretty fixed view of, you know, being able to perform excellence and that's how you get ahead um that's a it, it, that's a it's a shift um it's a shift in a way that you think about the uh, about um what success looks like and how and maintaining a mind a growth mindset is what actually has enabled me to succeed and that's part of what i hope we're we're trying to do here at cndr I want to actually follow up on that too, because yeah. I heard a lot of the things that the, the like I've sort of been saying is the reasons why I fell in love with the program in the first place is right. I don't think there's a I don't think professors can teach judgment. I think that they can demonstrate judgment, and then students through self reflection and uh, iterative processes then sort of choose to absorb judgment and then reflect it on their own and then that's a sick that's a cycle of uh effective communication that that i think yeah that you have to have be given the space uh, for that to develop because if someone just sort of pushes it uh, pushes the idea of what good judgment looks like uh, then you can sort of reflect it without understanding why it's effective good judgment so yeah i really i that that makes me excited that, <laughs> well the fact that that makes you excited <laughs> makes me really happy it means we're doing that, that something's going right here <laughs> well i think the thing about it is is that it's not about being the smartest in the room it's it's being the wisest in the room which is quite a significant deal harder and more difficult to be the wisest person than the smartest person and uh it's, it's nice to have a place that gives you the freedom to emphasize that yeah and so i want to turn to now uh the more public facing side because as a center we have academics but we also have this other piece where uh here mentioned we're training practitioners and judges um, we hold you know a basic mediation training every summer we do some advanced trainings uh 
we do kind of like, you know, networking events. Um, Hero started a colloquium, an ADR speaker series, where we've had a lot of wonderful speakers brought in. And that's an opportunity for like students to network, but also for the public to come and engage with these professionals and scholars. Um, and so it's really exciting that we can do that too, that it's not just academics. And our center is a little bit unique in the school. There's lots of centers here, but you know, we're one of the ones who's really got this more public facing piece. And we want to bring in alumni and professionals to be a part of the bigger community, to support all these wonderful things that we're doing and we want to do. Um, we have a really wonderful international reputation kind of on that side of what we do. Uh, and so maybe Howard, you can talk a little bit more about that because you've been a big piece of that international part along with, you know, Sheila's work. Well, so um, on the international side, um, uh, really under Sheila's leadership, um, the, um, the center, um, I think beginning in about 2011, um, with the uh, resources that came from a grant from the JAMS Foundation, <laughs> in fact, um, we were able to offer um, a, a seminar to um, foreign judges and lawyers, um, which um, the original idea was to try to do it annually. It hasn't been quite annually and the pandemic um, has gotten in the way. Um, but the idea, um, and it really grew in part, I think, out of Sheila's work in San Mateo and my work at the uh, district court um, as well, where we would have lots of, um, lots of foreign um, uh, visitors would be interested in um, how to establish court ADR programs. So um, the center pioneered this international institute that is focused on um, showing folks from other countries how to build a court annexed um, ADR program. And so um, the program has been um, variably three or four or five days in different iterations, um, but it really became a, a, a focus of this kind of international exchange where we would have lots of, um, lots of folks um, uh, coming here to the to the center um, to learn about um, how mediation works and how the um, uh, how uh, how best to what what the, what are the nuts and bolts of putting together um, a, a court annexed uh, ADR program and so it's really built amazing connections um, uh, worldwide. A lot of the participants are also folks who have been uh, JAMS fellow, international fellows through the JAMS um, and Weinstein International Fellowship um, Program. Um, and it's created a whole um, a, a vision for the center um, that, that um, is not just local, but really, really worldwide as a, um, a way of building expertise and building a community of folks all over the world who are interested in promoting um, the ideas of um, uh, ADR and, and its value. So uh, the center's played a, a great role, uh, a great role in that. And we're, I think, you know, the, the current question is now in this pandemic and post-pandemic world, what's that going to look like going forward? And that's still an open question that we're um, thinking through. Right, Hira? <laughs> Good. Yes. Excellent. And we welcome your ideas, you know, for the future and what's next and rethinking these programs and things and what we're going to do in the future, uh, because we don't exist in a vacuum as well. Uh, so perhaps we could see if there's any questions. We've been talking a lot. I'd like this to be more conversational. Yes. I'm just curious, uh, Howard, when you, when you talk about Browns, you set up Browns with, with uh, mediators in camps. Have so you know, since I've moved to jams, I I have not been engaged in this. Um, you know, I, I uh, there's some there's a, a program that we that we um, did for more than fifteen or fifteen or twenty years at at the district court, and it's still going there. I think there there certainly are um, uh, efforts like that that exist among the jams mediators, but the program that we ran at the court um, was based on the idea was really uh, not topic based, it was case centered. So the idea was, um, and it remains that um, mediators who work on the courts panel um, 
volunteer if they want to, to participate in an ongoing practice group. And the, the idea is to meet with the same stable set of people who you uh, develop relationships with. Um, the groups are uh, anywhere from eight to 12 people or so um, you know, who come together monthly at the same time each month, um, commit to and take turns bringing cases to talk about. Um, and, uh, and then there's a kind of guided discussion about what happened, what went well, what didn't go so well, um, and a sharing of ideas about how to, um, uh, how to learn from whatever the experience was, all done in a confidential way um, where nobody talks about, you, know, you have to uh, shield who the parties are, obviously because of mediation confidentiality. Um, and uh, they've been remark. I, I think that I, I think they have been remarkably successful um, as an. In, in, in my mind, they're the um, one of the best ways um, to have continuing education as a mediator, um, as opposed to going to a class or something like that. Because it's you're talking about what's really going on in the room, and how can we learn from that, and how can we talk with other experienced pe other people about. Uh, uh, about that. Um, so, you know, I, I came to jams right at the outset of the pandemic and, and I needed to you know, kind of get my feet wet there. I'm not sure whether that would work um, at jams or at ADR services or at any of the, those other institutions. It might, um, but it's not something that we've been doing that, that I've been engaged in since leaving the court. The, the way you set it up originally was to say, uh, we have this program, you know, similar to law school when you had your study group. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's set up a study group of, of mediators. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Yeah. I mean, I said, I, what I, I sent out, um, and, uh, a notice to all the mediators on the panel saying we were going to experiment with this. We're going to offer this. It's not mandatory. Um, but if you're interested, um, you, you should sign up. But what we want is a commitment. We didn't want, I didn't want this to be just like a drop-in group. I wanted people to build relationships with each other because part of what allows you to really reflect on what happened is if you're in a group of people who you've developed some relationships with and some trust, um, my experience of the drop-in situation is that most people are performative in that setting. They're trying to show off how, how well, how, how good they are to their other peers. And I wanted to break through that and get to something that was real. In a way, it's something that Ari was talking about that happens in the classes. That first, what you do in, those, in the mediation clinic or um, in any um, deep class about ADR is you need to create an atmosphere of trust among the participants so that when we then get into the simulations or into the deeper discussions about what's going on in the cases, that you feel um, safe enough to talk about the things that didn't go so well. Um, and that might, that, that uh, so you wanna create a different sort of an environment there. So the, so the offer was come, but you have to commit that you're actually gonna come and we're gonna get to know people. And then we kind of move slowly to establish trust. Now, some of those groups have now been going for 15 years um, with the same, you know, it's a little bit of a rotating set of cast of characters, but where, you know, the, the same people come together and chat about what happened. Was there any monitoring done by, by the organizers to see how things were going? Well, the organizer was me, uh, and I was and I was leading each and I was leading each. So, so while I was at the court, I had four ongoing groups, and then my call and my colleague would have another four. So one of the staff people was in every group. So we were we were um, uh, present and could see what was happening. So it wasn't just the people themselves; it was you also entering your. Yeah, it was. It, they, they were guided by an experienced person, but not. Well, I mean, uh, Rachel, you were in one of them for a long time, and Teresa has been. And Teresa has been in them for you know for fifteen years. So you know, there's a the the leader is sort of a guide, but not the teacher, and that's a there's a subtle that's difference right. there. Very interactive, very confidential. What happens over time is the egos kind of fall out. <laughs> And people really build 
you know, it's very frank and honest relationships and kind of a feeling of safety, you know, it's, um, no, it's, and real learning experiences. I mean, it sounds sort of neat because most times we're sort of an island out there trying to do our, our craft. No, no question. To, uh, to, to be able to share ideas that way sounds that's something I have heard of before. Yeah. It's wonderful. Well, I, I would contrast it. So the ABA tried to create reflective practice groups, and I think it failed on other reporting at the time. Maybe I should be less <laughs> but, you know, I sat in on one, and I thought this is a disaster. But part of that was I also thought, well, okay, I've been having you know the the you know hugely. I mean, I I had Daniel Bowling, then I had Howard, and then I had Tamara, and seen very different styles of reflective practice for years. But people who are able to take what they the theories and the concepts and then put them into words, but also guide the conversation in a true Socratic dialogue as opposed to a teacher. So the, the key is that people come in with a collaborative mindset, not ego-driven, and it's really, you gotta check your ego at the door to be able to get feedback and help from your colleagues. You would not be offended that somebody who's brand new as a theater has insight, but oh, great, I can go use that somewhere. Even though I've you know been doing it for a long time. Well, I mean the, the, the conflict I see is, is in every commercial this is how you do mediation course. I don't remember ever a part where there's any self-reflective part. And when I was judging some of the mediating contests that were put on, I don't know about you, Clint, but we, we didn't have enough time to see that, but uh, those sorts of contests that there was a portion at the end of any session where the students would come together and they they self reflect and I think that's what the hell they do in that for, you know. And, uh, and now I'm getting more of a sense of what you guys were all about. It sounds really awesome. I think what's helpful, though, is when you have people who have been in these classes to have them go out into the world in that way to be able to engage in that. It's, it's like a beneficial virus that they're out there <laughs> doing good things. Yeah, best word is it with <laughs> <laughs> they, they know how to do this. And then it's a it is a collaborative effort though, which is not how we teach people to employ competitive profession, et cetera. So you have to have people can develop that relationship that power talks about and work together. We do it as Jacob class. There's a small there are small groups of people who do it. And then it becomes where, oh my gosh, I get a text message from somebody. Each side points to they hired the same expert witness. What did we do? You know, I'm like, you know, there's there's different folks you can ask them in real time if you've engaged in a if you're if you develop that relationship and it's your water cooler basically. I and mean, it's otherwise a first set of solitary profession. But we think that we take that same skill set and Oh, yeah. yeah, I think whatever the mechanism is, having a way, ha having a way to be self-reflective about what's happening in whatever the work that you're doing. I mean, this is true about lawyering too. I mean, it's really that it's about about life, and then also developing some, you know, whether it's through a practice group or more informally, some network of folks who you can call upon to. Um, to to help you because we're all going to encounter situations where you know i'm not sure i did that right or i'm not sure what to do and i have and i, and I want to, somebody on the on other end of the phone i mean i i remember the last time i called rachel with an ethical issue related to an inch to, to a problem in an insurance case that i was dealing with and i and because we had that connection i I picked up the telephone. Um, so I, I just think that that's part of, and part of it, again, just to drop, drop back to CNDR, this is a part of what's so strong about this center and this whole approach is that it does promote this way of thinking about what it means to be a lawyer, what it means to be a professional, what it, how, and how you go about your work as a mediator, as an arbitrator, or, or wherever. And, and for me, hearing this to tie it together, to I, I was using a word that sounded pretentious. It is pretentious, avant-garde. But what I what I meant <laughs> what I meant by that was it, it, it's about taking things that are happening in practice that are now best practices that you're out there grinding to figure out, 
and, and then put them in school so that it becomes part of a playbook for what the baseline is, right? And so if I could think about uh, now hearing people with feedback, and it sounds like you've been a judge at the competitions, is that, yeah, the, the, that framework is what the team is. And, and building it in is that this is the way that you need to think about how you should approach a negotiation problem and how you should expect to communicate with others about it is in that meta sense, the thing that we're trying to kind of engender. And it's, it's neat for the students to have not only the ability to self-reflect, but to be judged on the degree to which their self-reflection was correct, right? That not that they were out there, you know, saying, I, I'm the best at everything, right? But to, to assume that the people who do drop their egos and do develop a, a, a you know, a, a pathway to being critical in, in a useful sense actually benefit from it. And it's about building those things into the education process, right? So that it becomes, hey, I don't just learn that there's such a thing as negotiation and mediation and in it, you might use interests and in, in positions and here's what the difference is. But if I'm going to apply those things, what kinds of things are going to count and pass as doing a good job and doing a bad job? And what are the variations? And how will I find that out? And who will I talk to? And what will I be comfortable exploring? Right. And that's the that's the part of it that's 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 weird that you have to say, we're gonna set up an organization that just does that. Um, and uh yeah, appreciate again and coming back to the CNDR that it's it's a, a place that that encourages that kind of thinking, right? Which is really, you know. Yeah. And I love the idea that things that work for us in law school and that are valuable, we can bring into the professional world and continue them. We don't have to leave these skills in law school. Right. And I'm hoping that our students will take that with them as they infiltrate the profession. <laughs> Could I just do one last word on the round? Let's do one I last think, word on the round. So when I did my clinic, um, none of the students knew each other going into it. Um, and it's really all about kind of what you put into it you'll get back out of it and we all took it really seriously over you know just three or four months um rounds especially it's really sharing in everybody's success and struggles and learning from both ends of it you know you, you figure out who you can go to who's really good at everybody's really good at certain things different things and and just having that available to you is invaluable and and through just that three four months um we went from not knowing each other before and now of that whole um mediation clinic group is, is some of my best friends in law school yeah they have a group text chain where they like send photos and messages to each other it's the sweetest thing I've ever. <laughs> um, all right so i see that lunch is here so i'm going to adjourn us and i'll say thank you to my students ari and casey and thank you to professors clint wasad and howard Harmon, and thank you all for joining us Please help yourself to the lunch. Um, I'll say some more.